All right, here we go. Today we have R&B royalty in the building <laughs> from the multi-platinum group, New Edition, solo album, multi-platinum, multiple solo albums, multi-platinum, Johnny Gill. Welcome to Vlad TV. Man, I done made it. I done made it. I made it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with Vlad. Yeah, I made it. I was just telling you earlier, I was like, man, you've been around a long time. Yeah. This is a trip, man. It's yeah. like, I'm uh, honored to be here. Honored Thank you, man. We're honored to have you here. Thanks for having me. First time here. I want to start in the very beginning. So you're born and raised in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. Yeah. Yeah. Born and raised. Okay. And uh, two-parent home. Yeah. Your dad is a, a Baptist minister. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there was four boys? Four boys. And my, you know, and we you know we, my dad was a minister, so we we grew up in sort of, sort of a strict household, mm -hmm. you know, and- uh, I didn't understand it as a kid growing up because my brothers, it's, I have three older brothers, and um, those at the time, uh, those were the only ones I knew about. <laughs> so <laughs> I do have a stepbrother and found out I had a stepsister at, uh, later oh, oh, on. Oh, dad had a few, a few side kids? Yeah, he was laying uh, hands on a few. <laughs> 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 Do some healing, some healing uh, on some of the female. Uh, uh, sexual healing. <laughs> what was going on? Okay. <laughs> okay, so what was D.C. like in the late 70s, early to mid 80s? Man, D.C., because I was a kid, it was fun times. You know, when you're a kid and growing up in, even though it was a sort of a strict household, it was family. It was always family. Mm -hmm. uh, from my cousins to my aunties and my grandmother. And it was like a... Uh, uh, a, a time where we would always, at some points, we were, family was gathering over somebody's house on the weekends, cookouts, it was all this stuff. So uh, that's all I knew. And, you know, as a kid growing up, you know, you have no worries in the world. You kind of like, you, it's just, it's your, you, your siblings, your cousins, and you're arguing and fussing and fighting over stuff. And the next minute, you know, you're playing and you're out in the yard playing. And we lived, grew up in, you know, in, in D.C., uh, uh, most of my childhood in in a home in a house where we had our own yard backyard and we were able to get out and 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 have that level of freedom mm -hmm. you know which was um you look back at now i didn't understand how fortunate and blessed we were at that time but you know when you look at where and how things are today and how you have to keep an eye on kids and yeah. the things that goes on now in society it's like you go wow man we had those were the good old days <clears throat> You know, a lot is to be said about having a two-parent home. You know, yeah. a lot of times people try to downplay me. Oh, my mom was the mom and dad. And, yeah, especially with boys, it's it's hard for a mom to raise boys right, yeah. properly. Yeah. They'll, they'll do their best. Yeah. But yeah. have a dad around. You know, I, I came from a two-parent home as well. Yeah. It goes a long way. A long way. Yeah. And that's what I believe brought more balance to me. Even when my mom and my dad uh, ended up splitting up and going their separate ways, there was enough of dad and enough of mom in the home that, um, uh, you know, it it came at a time where at least as I got older, I understood what what a good home felt like, what it meant, you know, and uh, and what it looked like. Right. So uh, as I got old, as I grew older, and my mom and dad separated, and uh, it it I think out of all of the kids, I was the one that took it the hardest and I think it impacted me more probably than than my other brother than my three brothers uh because I was one of those kids because my dad when he was there my dad was a great father it was you go home you come home from school there's many bikes go-karts there's bicycles there, there was always something uh on the weekends he was taking us he had a little convertible would take us for long rides you know and then uh, as we got older, I mean, we got, he just for some reason decided one Christmas to bring us, buy us all instruments. And, you know, I didn't have a clue um, to, that I had uh, this, this connection with music and with instruments. All the instruments that I play from guitar to drums to keyboards, all that stuff, I taught myself. Really? And, and okay. I, I didn't, you know, it took me a, a while to understand that that's not normal or natural for most people. But I had an, an <laughs> it was funny because I had 
at the time I didn't know what it was, but I just had this thing I was interested in, in, in the uh, instruments. And when you growing up, I had three older brothers and, you know, kids are kids. We fight find ourselves at times. No, get off my, no, you can't play with my toys. No, you can't get up, get off, don't touch my toys. So we had that kind of rivalry going at times. And then, so I found myself at, as a kid sometimes would play sick and not go to school because I was intrigued with their instruments as well as mine. And I wanted to figure out how it worked and how, and <laughs> nobody could understand why I knew how to play everybody's instruments. But when they were at schoolhouse, <laughs> tinkling with their stuff and playing, and I didn't know what the word meant, what what that was, and at the point of you know just wanting to being intrigued with the instruments, I had no idea. I just knew I wanted to mess with everybody's uh, stuff, so I knew they wouldn't allow me to do it when sometimes when we were at home. So when they were at school, I was getting it in. <laughs> okay, so you start singing at age five. At age five, yeah. Okay, in yeah. the church. In church. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And was it just natural? Was it like as soon as you started singing or did it take a little while to develop and vocal lessons and so forth? Never took vocal lessons. Um, it was something that kind of developed uh, naturally because, you know, my dad, when you have, when, you know, when you're uh, a PK, you know, my dad had uh, on, on sometimes on Mondays and Wednesdays, uh, they would have, you know, you have to go, you know, you're in church all day on Sundays. And then, you know, from those Bible studies and going to church and being in church, you know, uh, all the time, you know, it was always singing going on. This was the weirdest thing for me because as a kid, I thought, honestly, I thought everybody could sing. Because when you grow up singing, in, in ch especially in Baptist church, everybody wails. Everybody pretty much can sing. So I never thought there was anything different from what I was doing um, besides just what everybody else does, sing. Well, my dad bought us those instruments and uh, I started playing and, you know, it was weird because it wasn't weird. It was just I was the youngest and my brothers, they would push me out front. And I always make this joke about my dad being almost like a minister, Joe Jackson, because my dad started us to rehearsing and start for us to start singing, to start singing in church. And my dad was, you know, when I was a kid, my voice was so high <laughs> that you would thought you would have absolutely thought it was a girl singing. And <laughs> I, you know, just out of one, yeah, when I turned about 13, 12, 13, all of a sudden my voice one day just took a drop. <laughs> But um, all that time, and my dad used to wear, he used to get on me about singing so high. And I'm like, hell, I didn't know. I'm just singing because it's just how my voice was and I was just singing. But my brothers would push me out front and uh, I didn't know any better. I was just like, you know, okay. Well, right. You guys were in a group called Wings of Faith. The Wings of Faith. Right. Almost yeah. like a Jackson 4 kind of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Little John. It was Little John. And the wings of faith. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Little John and the, and, and the wings of faith. Yeah. The wings but of faith. even before then, we were in a family group with my aunties and my cousins and my grandmother, a group called the Gospel Stimulation. That was actually before the Little John and the Wings of Faith uh, uh -huh. took shape because we started with my whole family. Yeah. Okay. So you had a friend, uh, Stacy Ladisaw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She convinced you to record a demo? She was the one convinced me to, to record a demo. The craziest thing was, this is like so crazy. It was, we grew up and, you know, uh, we went to elementary school together. We sang in uh, uh, this place, uh, this thing called the Glee Club. And at that time in the Glee Club, everyone... You know, it was a little, just a little group thing that they had at, in elementary school where there was several people that we, you know, all just would gather with the music teacher and we would sing, just she would make us, teach us different songs. Uh, and it was so funny because um, after Stacy ended up getting her record deal, uh, Stacy became quite popular and, and and it was crazy because we all used to hang out. Her, her, her house was the hangout spot. Like after school, it's like her place was like Disneyland to us. <laughs> after school, we would go, everyone would meet over there. We'd play 
you know, volleyball, softball. We would go. Uh, there was a guy who I still am dear friends uh, with today, uh, uh, Bob Pitts, who used to come pick us up, all the kids that was over there in the neighborhood, take us bowling, roller skating. It was like, you know, you didn't know what was going to happen from day to day being over there. But that was like the hangout spot. And um, yeah, and so we hung out and for years over there. And I remember uh, my mom and dad had split up years before. And they were actually talking about trying to reconcile and come back together. And I'll never forget um, we packed up our things and uh, was heading back to Columbus, Georgia, because that's where my dad had uh, moved uh, to. Well, he actually was in Phoenix City, Alabama. But when we, we many years before, we had moved to Columbus, Georgia for a few years before my mom and dad split up. So when they uh, talked about uh, getting back together, and we ended up going, uh, making plans to go back to uh, to Columbus, Georgia, uh, to live, we had packed up everything and started heading and making our way back there. And I remember getting there. We were when we we arrived there, and my dad was talking about he had this place for us and all the stuff. Blah blah blah. We got there. We looked at the house, and I'm looking at the place that we were getting ready to to move into that wasn't even finished. And it was not like it was a house being built. It was just, it needed work. And I'll never forget walking out on that front yard into the front yard and thinking and saying to myself, looking up in the sky, I said, boy, what I would, what I would do to be in Stacy's shoes right about now. Hmm. Lo and behold, maybe a few days, Afterwards, I got a phone call from Stacy. Okay. It's the craziest thing I've ever experienced in my life. And I understand when people talk about manifesting and all that stuff, that's where it all started for me. The first time I have experienced, I experienced that. And I didn't even know back then. I, I, it still didn't register to me. That's what this is called manifesting. But, um, and I remember she said, hey, I talked to the um, president of the record label about you. And um, he wanted to um, he wanted to, to to hear you know hear hear your voice. And there's a possibility he didn't want to sign you, but he wanted to hear your voice because we was telling him about you, her and the mom and her dad. And I remember we, I said, yeah, we're coming back to uh, D.C. to pick up some more of our things uh, in a few weeks. And when we arrived, I talked to her, and then they also introduced me over the phone. To the president of the le- of the record label, uh, Henry Allen of Atlantic Records. Of Atlantic Records, right. yeah, which is a big deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I re- I remember this guy asking me to sing over the phone, and um, I sang over the phone first before I did that. She asked, she said that he wanted me to make a demo tape. You gotta understand, for me, I'm from the church. I don't know what the heck the hell the, the demo tape is. Right, and so. I had a $29 tape recorder, the ones where you press record and play and- you know, Two fingers. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so I, you know, I sang uh, The Greatest Love of All and I sang uh, the Manhattan song. Um, no, I sang, uh, yeah, it was the Manhattan song. And then when uh, I made the tape, they got it over to him and I got a phone call. And he asked me about singing um, over the phone. And I sang for him over the phone. And he said, yeah. He was a big cigar (laughs) cigar smoker. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Listen, hold hold on, hold on. Sing it, sing it again. Sing this again. So he went and got a couple of people and he put them on the phone. I sang again. (laughs) He goes, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Little Johnny, little John, what? I said, yes. He goes, yeah. I, 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 sing it again. I, I want you to sing it again. He went and got the, <laughs> some of the staff from the, on the floor, third floor above him, and I, I think I, I don't know how many times I must have sang for him over the phone. And then from there, he says, you know, I want to, uh, uh, we want to bring you to New York. He says, have you ever flown on the plane before? I said, no. <laughs> Never. 
I was a kid. I might have been uh, what all of fourteen. Mm. Yeah, and um, um, you know when we finally got to, uh, I they brought me up to New York and gave me all the instructions of to my mom what was happening, what we need to do, because my mom didn't come with me. Uh, they had someone, this guy named Clarence Bullock. They call him CB. He was, you know, met me there in uh, New York. First time I'd ever gotten on the plane. And uh, I had my little guitar and uh, uh, my uh, my slacks and my, my shirt and dressed up thinking, you know, I didn't know what was that, what was going to happen. But I did know this. Uh, when you start talking about a record deal back then, that meant we knew that was major. Mm-hmm. Well, especially with Atlantic. Yeah. And it was it was the subsidiary, uh, Cotillion, right? Cotillion, yes. Right. Cotillion is where we, I, I my first record was uh, released, yeah, on that right. Cotillion. So it was crazy. It was, uh, that was a time. But I, just the fact that I, I remember when I was looking up in the sky and said that and said, wow, what I wouldn't do to be in her shoes and how all of it just kind of manifested. And then you sit there and you think, they someone who used to say, there's old saying, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> can, I, can I hear an example of what you sang over that phone? I did a, honey, you are my shining star. Don't you go away. No, baby. And uh, he Woo. just kept saying. <laughs> <laughs> he kept saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sing it again. <laughs> That's it. So you're not even singing original songs. You're just no, doing covers they, at this point. Yeah, it's covers. And then, but they heard the potential yeah. right there. But it was you, funny. Okay? Uh, it's, it's, God bless her heart. She's still a good friend of mine. She's like family. Her name was Pat. At the time, her name was Pat Jones. And she said to Henry Allen when they got the cassette tape, she told me this many years afterwards. She said, they heard the tape and said, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> because there was no music, no nothing. I didn't know right, anything about yeah. playing and singing and uh, or production and stuff. I had not a clue, none of that stuff. But God bless Henry Allen because he could hear from a raw from that raw point of mm. of what there you know the the the, the uh, talent that was there. And man, he he, he you know God bless him. <laughs> yeah, I mean this is back in the day of talent development and stuff like that. Yeah, as opposed to now where you already need a viral song yes. and you need a million views. Full production. No. You yeah, back then, mixed, if you, you heard that right voice, you're yeah. willing to invest. Yeah, and and actually develop that artist through multiple albums and and get them there. So yeah. yeah, yeah, it was a great time. Yeah. So so then in '83 you dropped your debut album, self-titled, yeah. Johnny Gill, yeah. but it didn't hit the charts. Well, you know, someone forgot to tell me. <laughs> so someone forgot to tell me you know and, and educate me about the failure because i had no clue when i released that album whether it was how well it did or how well it didn't do that it failed i had no clue about any of that stuff i was totally oblivious to the fact that you know even though you might got this deal there's a possibility that you might not be successful i didn't have a clue all I know is I was recording and singing and I made records and made music and that was it. Failure was not even in the, the cards for me. I had later realized, you know, that, you know, the album shipped platinum came back wood. But before that, I shit out of know. <laughs> well, all right. I mean, the album had two singles, Super Love and When Something's Wrong something With My, my Baby. baby yes. uh, Super Love peaked at 29 on the Billboard R&B chart. Yeah, yeah. Uh, something Wrong With My Baby peaked at number 57. But this is the R&B chart which yeah. is not the main chart. So right. for a big label like Atlantic, that's not exactly a home run. Right. And I didn't know anything about chart positioning, none of that. I didn't have a clue to none of that stuff. Right. So all I knew was like I recorded some songs that I that made the album and that was out as a single. So mm-hmm. it didn't, nothing registered to me to go. I never thought about it. Looked back and went, damn, it didn't work. So what am I going to do next? I didn't have a clue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, then that next year in 84, you and Stacey actually had a duet album, yeah. Perfect Combination. Which was Henry Allen's idea. And the single, Perfect Combination, actually peaked at 75 on the right. Billboard chart. So this was like your first somewhat hit. Right. You know what yeah. I mean? This was a kind of like you got over the hump. Just got over the hump or just uh, at least got everybody's attention. Yeah, and the album peaked at 139 out of 200. So, you know, you're you're progressing hey, at yeah, this I'm point. Yeah, I'm coming up. I'm, I'm, right. I'm on my way up. You're on your way up. <laughs> then in 85, you dropped your second solo album, Chemistry, which 
51 on the R&B hip hop album chart. So there's no real big singles off that either, right? Yeah, but no stopping me now. 51, come on now. Right. <laughs> You're getting there. You're getting there. Okay, so so let me ask you a question. By this time, were you and Stacy dating? Yeah. Stacy and I was dating before I actually had a record deal. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so back yeah, in kinda, DC. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I always like to say, I was standing up on my pimping even back then. And he was thinking, oh, well, now because you got a record deal. You know, that's how she, you know. No, 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 no. I, I, you know, I was kind of, you know, <laughs> standing up on my pimping back then, too. <laughs> but no, I, we, we just, uh, yeah, we, 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 we were childhood friends. And we went to elementary and we went to, you know, obviously to uh, junior high. And we were all hanging out all the time. And, um, uh you know, which just kids being kids. We just uh, were, um, ended up, uh, you know, just dating. And mm -hmm. uh, man, that was probably, yeah, that was my first love. And I first believe love. I was her first love, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, when you watch the, the New Edition series, you mentioned, well, your character mentioned that you guys broke up because her mom, and she was very light-skinned. She was black, but, but very light-skinned. Yeah. Her mom had an issue with you being dark skinned, which is why she broke up. And I remember having those conversations with Henry Allen and Bill and some of the other Bill Underwood, who was my manager at the time. And um, I've I said this, and I put this out too that even hearing them laughing and joking with me because uh, Henry used to call her Heavy Cream. That was her nickname to him. And he was like, yeah, yeah Heavy Cream, got, got got your nose open, huh? <laughs> you guys are... <laughs> yeah, you, you guys are real tight there, huh? You know, you know... You know, Sandra and them, don't, they don't really like that. You know, you, you're you a little too dark for her. And, and, you know, they don't, you know... So I'm like listening to all this stuff and I'm just a kid. So those things that was told to me... I, the one thing that I said that I stand on even to this day was that she never, her family, her mom, they, she never treated me or given me any indication like, well, hey, listen, you're too dark. We don't want you around here. You know, that was just from, you know, Henry Allen and those guys. And they used to laugh. Uh, there was another guy um, that uh, used to do uh, all the promotions for Deke DeBerry and a couple other ones they used to do promotion for Atlantic Cotillion Records in the in the metropolitan area. And so they all knew and had these thing where, you know, we're you know, we were told to keep an eye on you guys and blah, blah, blah. And you expect that we're kids. And as a parent, you start to recognize, I'm I'm sure as a parent, you're looking going, eh, I'm starting to see my daughter grow up a little bit and looking like this is getting a little more serious. So I would assume even as a parent myself that you know you got to go okay let me keep an eye whether i'm dark black, light bright whatever mm -hmm. keep an eye on this little motherfucker because we got to keep an eye on our daughter who's a who, who's in this business and god knows if she came up pregnant uh, this early that could could do a lot a number of uh could do damage to her life or and her career i mean when you look back and think about it now as an adult it would make only make sense <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, colorism, I mean, we're talking about the 80s also. Yeah. It, yeah. It's a little more pronounced. I mean, now you watch hip-hop videos and you see a bunch of dark-skinned women, but watch a music video in the 80s, yeah. it's all light-skinned girls. Yeah. hip-hop video, yeah. R&B video, whatever, yeah, all yeah, light-skinned yeah, girls. Yeah. At one point, the light skin was in, man. It was like, if you wasn't light, you wasn't right. <laughs> and if you was dark, man, it was like, yo, you got an uphill battle. But it was, you know, uh, and it was crazy because as a kid, I... I had a complex about being dark as a kid growing up. And I remember many times, I mean, we would go play basketball and a lot of times I didn't want to play um, too long because I always felt like I didn't want to be in the sun and uh, too long because I always felt like I was dark. And uh, not realizing even, like I said, even as a kid, that that was called a complex. <laughs> I just was like, just didn't want to be too dark and thought I was dark enough as it was and so when you're playing with your brothers with your buddies and you know your friends and, and they're like hey you know they calling you darky you black you black of me and it's like you know I, I actually develop a complex from that yeah that's too bad man that's uh, something that kids shouldn't have to go through yeah you yeah, know because yeah. that that carries on uh through life well the blessing for me is later on recognizing and realizing who i 
who I am, who I was, and understanding that, you know, that question hit me as I got older. And the question was, let me ask you a question. Why does people, and it's, whether it's Caucasians, whether it's just light-skinned people, why is it that they they like during the summer everybody wants to lay out, go to the beach and lay out to get what? Dark. And you start putting it together to understand that, well shit, if it's dark is so bad, why the hell is everybody why they don't want to get dark? You know, to understand that to come into my own and understanding that shit, being dark maybe is not that bad. It's that American bullshit, man. Yeah. It's the yeah. history of slavery yeah. and and you know, yeah. the the separation of of slaves back in the day between yeah. house slaves and field slaves and that bullshit and and yeah you go to it's funny because when I went to Africa you, you I really realized how much of a bullshit concept it is yeah because out there well, everyone's comfortable with yeah. being who they are yeah you know yeah. what I'm saying you walk yeah. around to Senegal and everyone's happy everyone's Everybody, you know yeah. but you go to America and there's and there's complex it was always it is yes the light skin versus the dark skin and mm -hmm. it's like you know and it really starts to I mean for me it it, it really affected me early on. Yeah. And then I started realizing as I got older, I didn't have no problem with women and options with women. So I was just thinking, shit, I guess being uh, dark ain't too bad. And I mean, I ended up with one of the, at that time, think about one of the hottest girls in the in the business. The two hottest women that was in the business at that time was, was, was Stacy and Janet. <laughs> right. So, you know, it was funny because, you know, they end up with, with her, with, 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 with Stacy. I was just like, I'm shoot. I'm not doing too bad. <laughs> Shout out to uh, Todd Bridges, who I interviewed uh, a couple of days ago. Oh, Todd, who actually yeah. was, who actually was dating Janet Jackson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Around that time, I had yeah. to salute that. That's that was, crazy. Everyone yeah. had a, had a crush on Janet Jackson Everybody. during that era. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Janet, I met when I was 14. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. you try to hit on her. Uh -huh. You said I tried to hit on her. Yeah, you tried oh, to hit who, on her. Who didn't? That's I, what I'm saying. I never who, tried who to hit on her. You just, I, you know, I've always been a gentleman, but I was like every other man. I was just like, you know, you were like, wow, uh, having a crush on her and all that stuff was absolutely. But I was just, I don't know. I even with Stacy, I I never went to her and said, hey, listen, I like you. I got a crush on you as a kid. I just, I was never the aggressor i've never been and even all my relationships never been oh, <laughs> my skin is so thin if i reach over to a girl and touch her hand uh even to this day and it looks like or feels like she's not responding you don't have to worry about me reaching again <laughs> like i'm not that guy i hey listen and if i even reach or make that 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 indication that hey what's happening i'm interested by you know going hey you want to go out or you know grab lunch or dinner or do something and i can feel an energy that she's not you know you don't have to worry about me asking again i'm not the guy that's persistent i don't know i'm just like hey all right <laughs> and so i kind of wait and this has been that way most of my life mm -hmm. if she steps to me then i know it's okay then i go <laughs> you like getting chills it makes me more basically. comfortable, basically. <laughs> but it's not even like, but it's just that I feel more, I guess, more comfortable with not because I'm I'm always thinking I don't want to offend someone, you yeah. know. And I'm like, I've seen what that's like too. But I also understand sometimes someone said well, I've heard it many times: a closed mouth never gets fed. Right. And I'm sure I've missed many opportunities when I look back and I think back to some of the girls and that I was in their presence and. I think that they like me or they were sitting there or I've, w women that I've talked to later on and it was going, well, you never, you didn't say anything or you didn't do anything. So I didn't think, and you know, and I'm like, yeah, I just never been that way. Uh, leading up to you joining New Edition, were you a fan of the group? Yeah, I was. Absolutely. And the crazy thing about meeting those guys, I was actually just finishing up my album when, and I was working with a guy by the name of Freddie Perrin who actually did all of the Jackson stuff. ABC, I Want You Back. Uh, he did, uh, uh, what was the other group? The Silvers, I think. He, he had been in with the Trabaris. The list goes on. He was a part of that Saturday night, uh, the Saturday night, what is it called? Saturday night, Saturday Fever, whatever it is. The, the, the movie that- uh, Saturday Night- uh, Saturday Night Fever. Saturday Night Fever, yeah. Yeah, and he, you know, he, you know, had uh, Peaches and Her reunited. The list goes on. And I remember we were in 
recording the album, wrapping up the album when someone came in and said, hey man, have you heard of these kids called New Edition? And the little dude sounds just like Michael. We were in the studio and I remember the guy playing it and Freddie listening to it and he goes, yeah. He says, wow, yeah. It, Tell yeah. about Ralph Trustman? Ralph Trustman, yeah, okay. yeah. And um, he says, he, yeah, he's, he's dead on him. He's dead on him. I'll, I'll never forget. And later on, they ended up working with Freddie Perrin at some point. Okay. But it was funny because Fer Freddie and I listened to it and right off the bat, we was like, I was like, yeah, wow, he does. He sounds like Michael. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, yeah. they, have, they both had the high pitch yeah. and the, the tone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so before you actually joined, New Edition started going through problems. Yeah. And Bobby Brown was acting out a lot. He was going through drug issues and arguments and doing shows where he would perform his song way too much yeah, and the other yeah, members would get was... pissed off and whatever. And it finally came down to a vote where they basically, well, management was behind it. Management basically told really the members it. and said, listen, you got to vote this guy out. Yeah. So the members voted him out. Our manager said, look, um, Bobby's hanging out with drug dealers. You know, he's getting in trouble with the police. He's missing shows. MCA is going to drop you. You're going to lose all your endorsement, sponsorship, whatever it is that could happen if you don't vote him out. If he stays in the group, you guys won't have a group. That's the way it was presented to us. Okay. It was like we almost, we didn't have a choice. So did every member vote yes? Yeah, every member voted yes. Okay. Some members wanted him to stay. I heard Ralph actually wanted him to wanted stay. Wanted him to stay, yeah. But yeah. ultimately, he had to go along with... The vote. The vote. The majority. The majority. Yeah. And Bobby Brown ends up getting kicked out of the group. Yep. Yeah. And around that time, Ralph Tresvent was talking about leaving to do a solo career. Yeah. So New, New Edition was kind of thinking ahead, like, look, if we want to be a group, we're going to need another lead singer. Yeah. And that's where you came in. But, you know, I often say this, and... Michael Bivens, who I believe I felt and I feel that was, he's always been very um, um, detailed and he's always ahead. Um, and Michael felt like, because I, I didn't know any of this stuff when I first joined the group. No one told me all the internal issues and madness that was going on. I'm thinking I'm just coming in and they wanted, they, you know, my, the story was, we want to go back to five members because it makes the, the it, it impacts the choreography, looks more effective, blase, blase. Okay. So that's what I was thinking. I didn't know all the other stuff that was going on at that time. But Michael was worried about the fact that if Ralph ends up going solo, which they had heard and knew he was working on some stuff, that, you know, because he was the lead singer of the group and he had is he was the most popular of the group. Their thought and fear was, he's not coming back. <laughs> he's not coming back. And it was crazy because it was so far from that that Ralph, Ralph and I talked. And, uh, and, you know, Ralph was saying, you know, to me too as well that he, um, it's well known now. He was, he said it was never about the fact that I was going to record and leave the group and never come back, you know, but that was what where Michael and, Ricky and, and Ronnie's head was too as well that, you know, he's working on some solo stuff. And at that point, they were just sitting there in the thought process of trying to figure out how we're going to eat. <laughs> Johnny Gill got thrown into the group without anyone really knowing, I guess. No, we, we chose Johnny Gill. Okay, but, but Ralph Tresman didn't know? No, he didn't know. See, because what happened was when Ralph told us he wanted to leave, we figured after the Heartbreak album, or after the whatever album we were gonna do next, that he was gonna leave. And so for the three of us, we were thinking, okay, how do we continue after Ralph leaves? So let's get another member, another mm -hmm. strong singer, so we can continue once Ralph leaves. We knew he was going. So that right. was the whole idea of even uh -huh. putting another member in the group. But it just so happened, MCA, um, they had Johnny Gill, but they didn't know what to do with this young kid with this adult voice. Mm -hmm. So it felt like a good synergy, a match at the time. We were trying to transition into a young adulthood out of the bubblegum sound. Johnny was trying to transition from, you know, being this young man into, you know, being able to get into mainstream. So that fit worked perfectly for us, but 
Johnny Gill was also signed to a solo deal. Mm -hmm. So then we found out once we were doing that, oh, he's going solo as well. It's, in, it's equivalent to, you know, uh, Michael and, and the, the Jacksons getting started early, and you got Michael as the lead singer, and Michael just after maybe a couple albums, two, three, four, three albums, and saying, I'm going to go solo. Obviously, your first reaction, the most popular one, the, you know, the man, if he should do that, uh, is our group over? Yeah, we won't yeah. have a group anymore, right. essentially. Yeah. Well, right. Well, from what I understand, though, Ralph didn't know that you were joining the group. Didn't have a clue. And, and Michael Bivens had apologized to him yeah. later on. Yeah. You know about this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So he yeah. was. So you just showed up one day and well, Ralph yeah. was like, who's this guy? Like, yeah. And he's like, oh, he's part of the group. He's, like, he's part of the group. Like, Yeah. Minneapolis. I'll never forget because Mike, I remember when I met, ran into Michael and uh, Hiram and I think someone else was with them at the at Universal's um, Amphitheater. And it was during the Whispers concert. And I remember we ran into, that's what we first ran into each other. And we was talking and, uh, and he asked me about uh, getting together to, to, you know, to do lunch and wanted me to come check out the show because they were going to do, they were playing the ice capades. And I'll never forget. I said, yeah, yeah. You know, because I knew them from crossing paths because we had done shows, you know, I've been on the same shows with them, you know, on several occasions. And uh, that's how that kind of started it, started the ball to rolling. And then we went, went to lunch and then, talk for a minute and uh, hung out. And then they wanted me to come and ask me about coming uh, to lunch again. No, coming to see the show. Uh, and I went and, you know, to check out the show. And then they wanted to do lunch again. And that's when they talked to me about, you know, my thought about joining the group and what my thoughts would be to, you know, to still have my uh, solo career intact, but just being a part of the group. And I was kind of like, uh... Okay. Um, and we talked for a long time about the possibilities of all that stuff. Even in that day, I believe that evening, we actually ended up going over to MCA, over to Gerald Busby's office and having a conversation with him about it. And, and Gerald Busby said, Ah, oh, Johnny Gill and New Edition. <laughs> and Mike, <laughs> nah, it's New Edition. And Gerald looks and goes, Oh, shit. And then he said to, uh, to Mike, he goes, later on, he says, you know, I, I was thinking about that, too. That <laughs> Mike said, I'm <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, New Edition had some hits by that time. Yeah, yeah. It had some, some serious hits, some, some big-selling albums. You're yeah. coming into a winning team. Yeah. I mean, listen, I was just, they came out the box smoking. They came out the box not building up from there. They came out the box. Yeah, like, they came out with hits. Yeah. As so, kids. Yeah. You know, I hear people say all the time, uh, regularly, you know, man, when you came in, you changed the group and it turned into this and that, blah, blah, blah. And, this. and I go, yeah, I, I came in and it made an, I, and it had an impact on the group. But what that group did for me and the reason why I am who I am today, um, uh, it, it comes from, we both we, we we both brought something to the table, yeah. and I, I don't think as hot, they were just the hottest boy band at the time, and that was the level of exposure that uh, I got from that. Um, being able to come into a group that was already successful and being able to display my my gift, my talent was really um, um, a blessing, and uh, you know for me and. You know, obviously, um, I often say Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis uh, were just beyond, I don't know what you can call them, just pure geniuses. And, and I call them great coaches because a coach, when you got a lot of talent, it's important that a coach knows how to utilize the talent. And Jimmy and Terry had the, uh, they just, they knew what to do and how they were going to, even with all the turmoil that was going on. They still knew and had a plan of how they they were going to bring me in into the uh, into the fold with this group and be yeah. a masterful job. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis are geniuses. <laughs> I mean, what they did with Janet Jackson and yeah. the Prince, and I mean, yeah. forget yeah. it. Uh, okay, so Bobby gets kicked out of the group. He drops the King of the Stage album, and it doesn't do well. Yeah, made me feel like at least I wasn't the only one. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. I mean, he had, I mean, Girlfriend, the Girlfriend single did okay, but the album was not like right, right, what yeah. he was used to. Yeah, and people yeah, were yeah. kind of trying to pit you guys against each other because you were viewed as Bobby's replacement, which really you weren't. You were more right. like Ralph's right. potential people replacement. So you weren't, but the way it was billed was like, Bobby gets kicked out. Yeah. You know, comes Johnny this. comes in. And, so and once again, here comes the brown skin, dark skin guy. Replace the brown skin, dark skin guy. <laughs> I didn't even guy. think about Replacement. that. Replacement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they couldn't get a light skin guy to replace Bobby, I guess. Okay. Okay. So you guys start working on New Edition's fifth album, Heartbreak. Yeah. Um, and before then, and you know, you you kind of touched on this. They're more of a pop bubblegum kind of group, Candy Girl and songs like that, which what they were known for. But you come in with this sort of deep, mature voice, mm -hmm. even though you were young at the time. You were 22, I think, at the time. But you yeah. had this kind of yeah. mature, kind of adult, contemporary yeah. kind of sound. At the age of 15, 16, uh, mm -hmm. that's what people kept talking about. And that's what the problem that the record label had with me. They kept saying, this kid's voice is so mature. When we did Perfect Combination, everybody kept going, this kid sounds a little like Teddy. And he's got, like, he's a kid. And they, the record label kept saying, how are we going to market this kid? Because he's got this old soul sounds, and but yet he's a young kid. And it was almost like the, the body had to catch up with the boys. Right. Yeah. Okay. So you guys put this album together. Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis are the architects of it. It comes out. And it becomes New Edition's most successful album up to that point. Number 12 on Billboard, it goes double platinum. I mean, how does it feel to go from these projects that were sort of like, uh, kind of there, kind of not quite there, to suddenly, now I'm double platinum? Yeah. I still, at that time, honestly, did not focus on chart positioning, um, wasn't so much focused on the sales. I knew I was already a part of something that was huge and was special when just joining and watching how the impact of of the music that we released all together had started really taking over because they were already popular, but it was just like you could see the surge um, uh, in that album. And you know when the Infinite in Love dropped, and we did like even in D.C., my hometown, we did a back then they used to do what we call in stores, and I remember. We pulled up to the in store somewhere in DC. I forgot where it was, but Maryland. It was a sea of people. And I remember thinking, holy shit. Like, wow. Yeah. Wow. You're in a different ball game now. This is a different, yeah. 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 So this is totally different than your other That's albums, your when duet reality album. No, hit this me. is, you're now in the big time. Yeah. That's when reality hit me. And I was like, whoa, shit. This is, this is real. And you guys, you guys had some hits on this <laughs> album. I mean, yeah. Can You Stand the Rain? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's at like 300 million streams combined. This is decades yeah. after it came out. And, yeah. and I remember watching the movie and seeing the depiction, you know, the, the you know how they kind of showed how you guys recorded. I mean, yeah. I think, I'm sure it didn't yeah. quite happen like that, but, it but to similar, show it. We, had, it we were hands on. Oh, so you were all in the room together like that? The, okay. Yeah, we were involved with... Well, at least Michael and the rest of the guys, because my mom was, was at the time shooting that movie, our uh, health was failing. So I was in and out, but I wasn't there as much. But hands, the guys were hands on on making sure that this story was being told uh, and that, you know, it was, you know, some of the stuff didn't happen in the exact sequence, but it was like what you saw was pretty much the truth. Well, yeah, I mean, if it isn't love, Huge song, um, you're not my kind of girl. Crucial, uh, any heartbreak, and boys to men, which is kind of your your solo song in a way. Boys to men, yeah, exactly. Because yeah. because you, yeah, you were because yeah, I guess yeah. like Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, they didn't want to put you like kind of on every song. They want to kind of ease you ease into the group too. a little bit. So yeah. that's why you're only on one solo song, but you're on All the other that, songs yeah. kind of in parts. Yeah, well, what was crazy was I. <laughs> when, we, when I first got there, I didn't understand the whole working proce process. And I remember some of the songs I would sing and then do, you know, ad libs. Like even on Can You Stand the Rain, I, I was doing some of the ad libs. And I remember Rick coming in doing, following some of the ad libs. And then it was some of the other guys. And so I started thinking at one point, I was like, well, what am I, a demo singer? <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> my attitude when I, when, when things, when we first got to Minneapolis and things blew up and Ralph didn't know, 
that I was even the part of the group. Um, I remember Jimmy uh, uh, Terry saying to me, well, you know, Johnny, you're not going to be doing any leads on the album. And I didn't even blink. I just said, I said, okay. Because my attitude was simply, well, whatever you guys need me to do. I had no idea, nor did I. And I still to this day feel like the one thing that I envy about Bobby and I envy about most artists that that hungers for the attention when you walk in the room or want to be out front and want to be the man. I never had that type of attitude and desire. And do I have an ego? Yeah, like anybody, uh, any other artist. But my ego is sort of about the fact that I know what I'm capable of doing. I'm not afraid to put anybody on the stage. I don't care who you are, what you do. I, and I enjoy it. I love it. Like, I welcome it. It's like not an attitude of like, come and I'm going to stump you out. It was, it's just always been the thing where I have this love and appreciation, respect for talent, for gifts. And I understand it probably comes from growing up in church and understanding what a gift means. And when you see people that are gifted, I really have an appreciation for it. So for me, coming in that group, I never sat there and thought about or felt like I need to be out front and I need to be the man and I'm the better singer. And I, I, it just never dawned on me. I just, my attitude was whatever you, you know, you guys need me to do, I'm here to do whatever that is and play my role. What's interesting is I, I didn't realize this until going through my research is, you know, I mentioned Bobby Brown's first album, King of the Stage, didn't do too well. Yeah. But his second album, Don't Be Cruel, was released on the exact same day as Heartbreak. Yeah. Yeah. Which was kind of crazy, if you think about it. Was that on purpose? Absolutely. I mean, it had to be on purpose. What, what am I asking? Of course it's on purpose. Gerald didn't want to say it, but never mentioned it. Never, I, I mean, they never mentioned it, mentioned it. But Lil Silas, God bless him, God bless his soul, he was, that was our guy. Uh, and, you know, there was a plan, I believe, that was, they had already had in place. Get Bobby's album ready to go around the same time, our album. And this, to even talk about the whole process of touring together, even though he was no longer part of the group. Yeah, I mean, but it's a little weird, though. I mean, you guys are kind of competing against each other <laughs> on the same release week. You see what I'm saying? And he was a key member of the group. So it's almost like you're kind of fighting against yourselves in a, in a way. Yeah, but they Did any of the thinking... group members ever ha have a problem with that album coming out on the same day? No, no, no one cares? Bobby was always and will always be. He was still family. And I don't think around. it was... Yeah, okay. and I think they were thinking, who knew? But I think what they were thinking is, well, we know what New Edition is going to do because there's an established hot boy band group. And since Bobby's going solo, this, he could pick it back uh -huh. off of. Okay, so the, everyone the, was the cool with it. Yeah, yeah. So it wasn't like, we're going, why is he released, released around the same time? As a matter of fact, it was perfect timing and it did work and to some degree uh, according to plan because his album took off. Our album was doing well. Right. But, then, but let, me, let me just interrupt you. What I didn't realize as well, uh -huh. because it ended up being such a monster album that when it came out, when Bobby's, Bobby's album came out, it debuted at number 74. It really didn't do nothing. Didn't do nothing. In it the just beginning. It started climbing. And, and it started. But then six months later, yeah. it was number one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, all five singles yep. reached top 10. Don't yeah. Be Cruel was a monster. My prerogative yeah. went number one. It was the second biggest single of 1989. Yeah. Uh, it won a Grammy. It went 12 times platinum. Yeah. I mean, so so really that album, yeah. uh, you know, the the Don't Be Cruel album became the biggest album out of the new edition family. Absolutely. Period, yeah. like three yeah. times what like BBD yeah. end up doing. Sure did. Yeah. So so like, by the time you guys were, because you guys went on tour together, and Bobby Brown opened up for New Edition, yeah. as well as Albie Shore. Albie Shore, Bobby, right. and no, the New Edition. Exactly. So by the time the tour was underway, Bobby started becoming almost the the bigger entity, right? Well, not for us, but they. <laughs> God bless Albie. Al B said at one point he called us in for a meeting and we had a meeting with him and he said, Hey, listen, I gotta go back to the lab and get some more some more music. Right, because so he had I'm, to go I'm, on after Bobby. Yeah, he went on he went on before Bob after Bobby. Yeah. yeah exactly. I think Bob went on first. And then that ended up Yeah, you do my prerogative up. and then you go yeah, to Al B sure if people yeah, are kinda yeah, like okay. switching. 
And then it got real. I think it started getting a little, little, little tough for, for Al, I think, yeah. later on in the tour because, you know, like he said, he's felt that maybe part of the thing for him was he needs to go back in and start working on a new uh, new album because, you know, it started, he started feeling, I mean, it was like, we, you know, that's what that time we were talking about, the, the light-skinned guys and all that stuff being in. It was like, man, at one point. I'll be sure it wasn't, it wasn't point, working out that way. Al didn't have to do nothing. He could just stand there and they was just screaming. Yeah, he pretty. was like, he just, you know. And then after yeah, a while. Was, Bobby came out with those hits, though. Yeah. He took his shirt off. And, and it was like, yeah, and Bob it. started coming in there. He was like, representing for the dark skin. I was like, all right. <laughs> we here. <laughs> okay. Was it around this time that Don King and Al Sharpton wanted to manage y'all? I guess at one point. When you were looking for new managers, right. Don King and Al Sharpton <laughs> were supposed to be your managers? Yeah, they came and uh, we interviewed them. And it was just... Uh, How so did that mad. go? I'm so mad they didn't put that scene in. <laughs> it was just, it was weird. It was just really weird. Um, Don King was like, you guys are going to be the greatest. And, and he was saying stuff like, just tell the world how great Don King is. And I, I'm like, we're like, what? Like, just tell everyone how great Don King is. <laughs> You're the manager. Like, like talk about me <laughs> and I'll, you guys will be huge. It was just <laughs> weird. At one point, it was yeah, Don King, Al Sharpton, and... Um, that was something that I, I wasn't privy to at the time, but mm -hmm. I had heard about, you know, them wanting to, uh, uh, to get in business with us or either the fact that, because Michael was always, to me, the visionary. Yeah. He always had these, these the, the creative ideas, not just creatively, from, you know, just the, from an artistic standpoint, but even on the business side of stuff. And... You know, Mike was always one of those guys looking to try to figure out, and he was the one that discovered right off the bat, well, later, why there was the jump and shoot and all that other stuff that took place that was sitting on the album that made them start, made him start looking more into, hey, yo, hold on one second here. So we're not signed to, you know, he was one of those guys that was always, um, he always had that, that, that kind of drive and, uh, and he understood, Michael tell you to this day, he really understood too that he was like, listen, I wasn't the most talented one out of them. I didn't, I wasn't the best singer or the best rapper. I was just, so I was trying to find my niche and where I fit in and what I could bring and my value to the table as a member, as this group. And, and God knows that was what I think still to this day would have cost us to continue to, um, to carry this, this journey on to be where we are 40 years later. Well, yeah, because a few years later, he came out with Boys to Men, yeah. which is the same title as the song as that you sang. Yeah. Exactly. And I think they named themselves after that song, right? After that song. Exactly. Yeah. And, and they became a mega group. Even though they don't talk about it to this day anymore, they were big fans of, uh, of ours of and of, my, of myself. Yeah. And I mean, clearly, I mean, it's still explanatory. The name is Boys to Men. They didn't, you know, but <laughs> exactly. uh, it's so funny. But, you know, they had family. They're part of our family. And, uh, uh, and I'm proud of them still to this day. And we have such a great relationship at, at what they've been able to accomplish because it's one thing to lead somebody to a place and give them an opportunity, but it's a whole nother thing, what you choose to do with it mm -hmm. and what they did with this the opportunity, you know, can't be denied. <laughs> well, uh, the next year you actually got uh, nominated for a Grammy uh, for uh, If It Isn't Love. Yeah. How did that feel? I mean, you didn't win, unfortunately. Who, who did you guys lose to that year? I don't know, but I felt like and still feel like Little Richard. They ain't never gave me nothing. <laughs> uh, 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 don't trip. Shut up. Tie your shoes. <laughs> I saw him one time, and he was the funniest guy I think I've met. Oh yeah, rest oh, in my peace, God, Little Richard, man. man. A character, man. I love funny people. I love to laugh. I don't care who it is. My best friend, my brother Eddie, one of the greatest that's ever done it. It's like being around funny people. It's the best medicine on the planet because they find humor and make you look at life and see things that you would never, <laughs> ever think about. And sometimes you go, oh, shit, I'm laughing at some shit. This is really not funny. But it's not because it's about being malicious. It's just when you can find humor in life, and sometimes we have these days where you feel like more so crying than laughing. It's like it is the best medicine on the planet. And for years, 
I, that's all. I, I love being around funny people. I love being around people who, you know, can find humor in life and things, you know? Mm -hmm. So then after uh, Heartbreak blows up, Belle DeVoe forms. Mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis suggested that that group come together, right? They sure did when they knew, because I still had an obligation to, to MCA at that time because Gerald Busby moved over to Motown. Mm -hmm. So I still had an obligation with, uh, with, with Gerald uh, was able to negotiate in the deal when he left from MCA to go to Motown to, to bring me with him. Bring you over. Exactly. So I still had, you know, even when I was with MCA, I was still, I still had an obligation to record um, as a solo artist with them because I had a solo deal. So they knew after that Heartbreak album, everyone knew and was aware I was, was going to have to go in, right. back in, to start the solo stuff. So Well, right, because Belle Bib DeVoe came out. Yeah. So that's three members right there. Yeah. Quadruple platinum. Yeah. Blew the hell up. Yeah, yeah. Ralph T came out with Sensitivity. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I love that song, by the way. Like, I remember when I, when I met him for the first time, I was like, yo, like, the song Sensitivity was such a moment, like, for the, me in high school. Like, I the, just listened to it over and over again. To me, that's the original, ultimate, smooth criminal. Yeah. <laughs> that oh, guy, yeah. Just uh, smooth. Yeah. And, I mean, th that album, I felt like it didn't do as well as people expected it to do. I, I thought it was great, but it didn't reach like BBD, it, it, yeah, well, don't it, be it cruel successful. status. It was successful, but yeah. absolutely, I think that, I think, we had already come out, Bob come out with his solo album, BBD, and then myself. And like Ralph always said, he was, he said, man, the pressure of feeling like now at this point, I'm coming out like last. It was like, wow. Like, you know, he said it was a lot of pressure for him on top of it, just being the, the last of the Mohicans coming out. Yeah. But he did well. And yeah, I mean, it went platinum eventually. Yeah. yeah but, but, yeah. you know, which is great. But then you're comparing it to, Bobby Brown going 12 times platinum, <laughs> you know, yeah. BBD going four times platinum, yeah. new edition going double platinum. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I mean, it did yeah. great. I thought it was a, it was a brilliant my album. album. I just realized I saw that the, the last count of my album of the Johnny Gill album, it's five, five million. And it's like, you sit there and you go, wow. Yeah. Wow. Right. And like you had just mentioned, your third album came out. Yeah. On Motown. Yeah. And that one four times platinum. Yeah. So you, yeah. did you double the sales of New Edition yeah. by yourself? Yeah. God yeah. damn. Yeah. Yeah. We had, I mean, you know, <laughs> 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 it was, timing is everything, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I also believe we got to, you know, in this universe, in the universe, man, sometimes things just have to align up, align, you know, uh, up right. And I think a lot of times, you know, we could sit and make these plans and do all this stuff, and yet uh, we could fall short. But I believe that it's just about everything just being lining up properly and then the right time, right place, the right everything. You know, somebody asked me, and every time I talk about a producer or meet a producer, and they say, yeah, man, I got. if you want to lose me immediately, let me meet you. And the first thing you tell me is, man, we got to write another, like another, my, my, my. It's like, right. Listen, I could never recapture that magic in that moment. I was in a time, place, and space that could never be, ever be captured again because right. just what it was. That became your biggest song. Yeah. Your big solo song. My, my, that was my, my signature. No, my, my biggest record uh, to this day is probably, I believe, uh, Rub Me the Right Way. Okay, well, I'm just looking at the, the streams. Yeah. Well, Spotify. now, you know what? Because I didn't count. You're not counting Yeah, so streams, My 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 is at but, 37 million. Rubby the Right Way is 21 million. Yeah. So, but see, now when you start talking streams now, which back then, yeah. it was all about record sales. It was sales, all about record sales. All we had okay, so you're saying that Rubby the Right Way actually outsold My My My? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, a uh, great album. A great album. Uh, Fairweather Friend was on there. Uh, Wrap My Body Tight was on there. Um so Better I mean, life. how did it feel to have a four times platinum solo album after having two albums that just didn't do all that well? Um, for me, I think it was, for me, it was obviously truly a blessing. But at the end of the day, you know, this is how you'll know the difference between uh, a true artist. Your thought process is it's working as great. My, my thought process is what's next? <laughs> what's next? I'm trying to figure out at this point, how are we going to 
surpass this. <laughs> and that was, that's a, a lot, lot of pressure. A lot of freaking pressure. Uh, yeah. And it's okay. You, What we can do, because nobody can, like at the end of the day, we can't guarantee anything. But what I do know is that when it was all said and done, um, when I look at that, uh, the album, the Let's Get the Mood Right album, and uh, there was a quiet, uh, the provocative album, but uh, the Let's Get the Mood Right album, which was another album that to me was like when you go from the beginning to the end, uh, I gave and did my, gave my, my best. And I, I've learned in my 40 years of being in this business. And even back then, I was at a point where I understood, let the chips fall the way they may when you've done your best and you know it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. When I get to a point, and that's what I do with all my records, you know, well, not records anymore, but all my music, is when I can listen to it for my own listening pleasure and I'm not sitting there critiquing it, that's when I know it's done. That's when I know uh, it's, I'm good to go. I, whatever happens at that point, I'm, uh, it's okay with me. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. But is your first album called Johnny Gill? Yeah. Your third album called Johnny yeah. Gill? <laughs> Sometimes I forget my name. And I just want to make sure everybody else remember too, shit. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at this going like, wait a minute. This this album sounds familiar, right? Did I, did I miss something here? <laughs> and uh, I, I mean, mean shit, who knew? <laughs> uh, I mean, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis had their hands all over this. Uh, Babyface. <laughs> yeah. Had his first hands time all over ever. this. The two of them, the two hottest producers. Mm -hmm. And people always thought that they had this rivalry that wasn't that was never the case. Right. Um, they were the ones that actually and uh, that came and joined forces and um, volunteered to be to put this album together mm -hmm. through my papa, Clarence Avon. Uh, yeah, we'll, Clarence, we'll talk. We'll talk about him. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. dad. That, um, that, that was awful. Uh, yeah, they were the ones that uh, he brought all of that together with them. But I. I had personal relationships with both of them and they wanted to see this work. And of course, you know, Papa put it, put it, he was the one to put all of it together. Well, you got uh, nominated for a Grammy uh, yeah. for this album for yeah. a best uh, male R&B vocal performance. You end up losing to Luther Vandross. And I lost to my buddy. And I'll never forget. <laughs> I mean, not a bad person to lose to. It's, exactly. not, it's not like you, 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 me? you lost to Milli Vanilli. Like yeah. you, you lost to a serious <laughs> singer. <right>? Yeah. <laughs> but here and now, and I'll never forget, Luther used to have these um, these uh, movie nights where everybody used to come. He would invite the who's who. And I'll never forget what time going over. And I, he used to have this thing where he has all have all of his Grammys at. And walked in, looked at it, saw my grandma said, Give me my goddamn Grammy. <laughs> <laughs> he looked at me and he yells, security. <laughs> Were you and Luther close? Yeah, that was my, that was my buddy, man. That Let me tell buddy. you. Um, Luther didn't, he was, was, I wouldn't call him recluse, but Luther didn't mess with too many people. He wouldn't, you know, every, <laughs> every time he would release, a, get ready to release a song, you know, he would, Call me, play it for me. Mm -hmm. And we used to just be talking trash. I mean, let me tell you something about Luther. Luther, when I tell you about funny people, Luther missed his calling. You want to talk about quick? Oh, oh he was a comedian. Fast. <laughs> yo, he can hit you. <laughs> fast, too. And he would call me, go, yo, I want to, what do you think about this one? This song, I'm getting ready to release this. I'm thinking about releasing this one. It's a single. And I, you know, talk fast and say stuff like, you know, I think that shit sucks. <laughs> You know what? I think though would have helped it if you give it to me. <laughs> oh, so you just say you suck right to your face, right? Say, give me that song. <laughs> so yeah, he was uh, truly, he was the one that introduced me and taught me about um, painting the picture. That means painting the empty canvas, understanding what tone is and how to, uh, how to tell a story. The two greatest Vocalist to me, that's the greatest storytellers to me. I have to say Luther and Lionel Richie. Mm, okay. Those two yeah, I can, can paint. Uh, oh, they're just the, the, the yeah. ultimate when it comes to painting the, a picture and telling a story and, 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 uh, and the, with their music. And, and uh, I remember him telling me one day, and he was like, you know my all-time favorite Johnny Gill song? And I was like, what? He was like... Uh, the song Baby Is You, and that was a, off the duet album with Stacey. And I was mm -hmm. like, what? 
And he said, yeah. And I said, I don't get it. I said, well, what is it that's, uh, that you like about it? He was like, it was your tone and the way that you, your phrasing. And I'm sitting here thinking, I'm going tone and phrasing. I'm like, shit, I just sang a song. I didn't wasn't, wasn't think about what, it, what I was doing. But it began to, um, to make me uh, understand and start paying attention to, uh, to more of his music more than anything and started watching and listening to how he would tell the story. Uh, Luther was very kind of private with his life. Yeah, yeah. You know, there, there was rumors uh, of him being gay or bisexual. I remember even reading an interview by him and uh, he was like, so are you asking for, if I'm bicoastal? Yes. I have a house in New York and LA. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> and, you know, all the years that I've been knowing him, never asked him, Yeah. never thought about, nor did I even care. I've, I, listen, I have so many friends that are from all walks of life, and I've never walked in front of or behind or felt like, oh, no, I'm worried about whatever. I'm like, I don't. Listen, yeah. whatever you, you want to be, whatever, you that's you. That's your life. I've always been taught as a kid who grew up in church and my dad being a minister and understanding that you treat people according to the way that they treat you. Mm -hmm. So I don't care. Yeah. They, I've, listen, I went for years, years of hearing people talking about, Oh, Johnny's gay, and him, Eddie and right. Tommy. And I heard that shit for yeah. years. You haven't made it unless you have a gay man. Unless you have when a gay man. When I heard my first Vlad is gay rumor, uh -huh. I said, I've made it. <laughs> I have <laughs> come to the promised land. Dude, I, I have been accused of being gay. Therefore, I, I have a level of celebrity that I have a straw for. Yeah, because I mean, there was the rumors about you and Eddie, but there was yeah, also a rumor was, about Eddie and Arsenio. You know, it was like all, all of us. It, 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 was, it was like it was you everybody. Just, and it's like, you know, and I think the sad part is that a lot of people weaponize that. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Well, I, we, I've had fights with, with you know, significant others. When they get mad at me. Oh, you're gay. Like, yeah. it's like, oh, okay. So, but so you know this why is how you're going to take that. it out on me? Like, and, you know and, I'm but not you know gay. Why? But and you, when you think about why people would do that, they do it yeah. because most of the time when you're dealing with a heterosexual guy, man, mm -hmm. part of what they think could be your worst thing. And most for most men, growing up as a kid, myself too, not knowing the better sometimes, you, you know, to be called something that you're not and yeah. being accused when you're a man that's probably the ultimate uh what you come that you could do to a man that call a man you know yeah. that's a man's man's gay until you begin with growing up and beginning to understand and the reason why it made me because in the beginning i used to be i would man i kept doing like any other man i kept going who the fuck is saying this shit and whoever it is, I'm going to whip their ass and blah, blah, blah. And you say, go, yeah, come with my face. I was, it's all that stuff. Right. And you began to realize and understand that um, I understand now in an odd, strange way what they went through and what they go through. Because imagine watching people that you would, you would encounter and you are looking at them or they're talking about or thinking and you could see what they're thinking and thinking, oh, they think, oh, I heard that somebody told me that I don't want to sign him because I heard that he's gay and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, like, get the fuck out of here. Are you serious? Yeah. You know, and you begin to understand what they on, what they went, what gay people go through and have gone through. And it really helped. It, it, yeah. it makes you more sensitive to their fight. And so I began to understand that sometimes God put us in places and began to make us walk through situations. And so we can also have an understanding of each other and of people. So, yeah. and that really taught me because I'm going to tell you, I lied to you not. I, as a kid and growing up and being heterosexual, yeah, you're around your boys. We used to be using those words loosely. Oh, shut up, faggot ass motherfucker. Shut up, gay. And we would do, because you don't know any better. Yeah. You don't know any better, but until you get thrust into that situation and begin to recognize and understand, there's nothing funny about that. There's nothing that you should begin to understand that you got to treat people. I don't care who they are, what they are, what they choose to do. You got to treat everybody with the same level of respect, yeah. no matter what their preferences are. I agree. And so I, as I got older and began to understand all of it, then I reached a point where I was just like, well, I said, well, you know, if you think I'm gay, then I'm like, listen, 
you're more than welcome because nobody's ever stepped to me and have sit in my face and have said, hey, you're gay, blah, blah, blah. And I've often said, and I used to tell everybody, I'm like, if you think I'm gay and you want to come and talk back to me or think that that means I'm a sign of weakness, a sign, or oh, you're accusing me of what you accuse me of, I'm like, hey, come talk to me, come step to me. And if you walk away on two feet, I'll be whatever you want me to be. <laughs> Not a problem. Well, uh, in 92, that's when Bobby ends up marrying Whitney Houston. Yeah. Yeah. Who, I mean, listen, I, I interviewed, uh, you know, Rodney Jerkins, you know, one of yeah. the great producers <laughs> of all time who produced Whitney for certain songs. And he said flat out, greatest female singer of all time. I love, I, I worked with Beyonce. I worked, I did a session with Christina. I never got a chance to work with Aretha. We talked about it. Mm -hmm. And I worked with Whitney. Um, Whitney different, man. Whitney different. You know how, You know when you know somebody different? When nobody's been able to do the national anthem yet and touch her. Yeah, that's true. That's I'm true. just saying, like, I'm just, and, and, you know, I'm just saying, like, people have tried, attempted it, right? People have tried. Yeah. And she, she's given us the staple. She's given us the bar of the national anthem. I mean, same thing with Marvin Gaye on the, on the male side. And who's, who could touch Marvin Gaye? I'm on with you, side. 200%. Those are you know? my two favorite. Like, right. who, 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 people have attempted it. People have tried. Hands down. Period. Hands Show down. me someone else who could do the national anthem Hands better than Whitney. Down. Can't do it. Hands down. You know, now Marvin Gaye probably had the best male rendition. Yeah. But yeah. there's no one female that has outdone that. I mean, her vocal range and, and tone was just through the roof. Did you get to know her? I mean, did you guys? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so you guys became absolutely. friends? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's my sister. And, you know, and obviously through Bobby, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it was so crazy to... I mean, even before she passed away, <laughs> she used to, because she would come out on the road sometimes. Oh, really? Which, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And would she ever get on stage and do anything? Or? No, she'd just be on the side of the stage. She's on the side, just watching, watching rooting, her husband. Yeah, yeah. Rooting him on. And, yeah. And I remember we, we've had many, many conversations, and she wanted me to, uh, to do a gospel album. And she uh, asked, yeah, she asked me about doing a gospel album. And she kept telling, and she said, you know, she goes, I'll help you. You know, I would help you. And so, over a course of probably three, four, or five years, it's like when we would always we see each other, and she always go, "I ain't talking to you. I'm not talking to you." And I'm like, "What?" I said, "I'm. I swear, I'm going to. I'm going to." And it's so crazy because even when we lost her, that was my thought process of thinking, maybe this is the time and to do so and to dedicate it to her. Because I did. I promised her that I would. I yeah. said I would. I mean, when I interviewed uh, Rodney. You know, his dad was a, a preacher in a small church in South Jersey. And he was saying how he got a call from Whitney one day and she was like, where are you at? He goes, oh, I'm, I'm at my parents' house, South Jersey, you know, about to go to church. She's like, I'm coming. She's like, what, you're, you're coming? No, I'm, I'm coming. I wanna, I wanna go to your parents' yeah. church, your dad's church. Yeah. And she showed up in this little ass church with like, you know, 50 people and got on stage and started singing. And yeah. everyone was like, oh my God, this is Whitney Houston singing in our church. Like he said, it was wild. Yeah. You know, but you're right. You know, she had this this passion for gospel and it's really too bad that she never really did it with you or by herself because yeah. it would have been a phenom. If you see, go to YouTube, you'll see the Bobby's mom service, Whitney and I sing, uh, uh, never would have made it. Hmm. To, and man, it just went on and on, and we were just in a zone. We were in a zone, uh, and that was the only time that uh, we did something a gospel. But well, we did some stuff together where we we uh, did a tribute for Luther mm -hmm. uh, together. But yeah, um, that was her passion, gospel. No matter, listen, how you chop it up, uh, that was her passion as well as it's still mine. Um, listen, in my show today. Um, there's a section that I go into a place in my concerts today that we lose it for about five minutes or so where it, no, it goes completely somewhere else left. <laughs> and then I have to bring them back bring in. Back. Yeah. But I do that simply because this is where I come from. Yeah. And I have no shame in allowing people to know that through all of the, the 40 years of doing what I've been doing, uh, the, the sticks and stones that were thrown, uh, the, the things that have, we've had to go through and I've had to go through and yet I'm still standing through nothing but the grace of God. Mm -hmm. And I've often tell everybody I'm a spiritual man who's not leaving that base that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. So I look at all of these things. I look at where I've been 
what have I've come against and how I've made it through some of these things. And I just want to be able to stand in front of people and make sure people understand and know, listen, don't get fooled by this, all of this stuff. This, it's, this, it's all been a blessing only through my hard work, but understanding that it's much deeper than that for me. And my believing I've been here for 40, these 40 years has not been by coincidence or by accident. Well, in 93, you had another solo project, Provocative. Uh, quiet Time to Play. Ooh, uh, man. A Cute Sweet Love Addiction. Yes. Uh, I Know Where I Stand, which is a gospel song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and The Floor, which was the biggest song yeah, on that project. Yeah, the first, yeah. Uh, that hit 56 yeah. on yeah. the Billboard uh, Hot 100. Yeah. Uh, how well did this album sell, though? It didn't do as well as the last it one. It went, a half, I think we did like a half a million gold. What, gold? Yeah, yeah. Not so bad, but it's too. not yeah, the four exactly. million didn't, that you just no, hit. No, was it a disappointment went, at all? Or? Yeah, that was considered a disappointment. But the thing is, some kind of way, I, I haven't gotten to wrapping my head around, I keep the go and call or ask, ask the labels, like, how many do we sell so far? Or how, where we sell? And I, it's just the craziest thing is the weirdest thing for me because I, my thing about my art, it's just once I can listen to it and I'm like, I can listen to it for my own listening pleasure. I feel like I'm like, okay, let the chips fall wherever they may. And that's kind of was one of those things too, where uh, listening to that album, it's just one of those albums that I put on and I just enjoy. Um, and I was able to walk away from that album going, wherever it's going to go, whatever's going to happen with it, let the chips fall where they may. Now, listen, do I want it to be, I want to be successful based on the level of what they think or what they, what everyone defines as successful or selling tons of, absolutely. But it never bothered me or bothers me emotionally or psychologically it gets me to a point where I'm just going, damn, it, I, I failed. It didn't do as well. Mm. Well, in 1996, uh, New Edition reunites for the Home Again album. Yeah. This is the first album in eight years. And it actually has all six members. Yeah. So Bobby Brown Comes. came back into the, into the fold again. Yeah. Was that by design, by accident? It was by design. By design. Something I was meant, I meant to, I was going to say when you was talking about me replacing Bobby that people don't realize, even when I joined the group, when I got in the group, uh, Bobby told me, it told me we had talked and he was saying, man, I remember when you first joined the group, I was, I freaking hated it. I was so jealous and was like, man, he said, when you, when you opened, you know, your mouth, I saw you on, I saw you singing and I was just like, I just, I was like, damn, damn. Bobby would come out with me on the road when I had my solo uh, tour. Bob would come out on the road with me to hang out. Bob would come to LA and would stay at my house. <laughs> and it was so funny because we would hear people always talking about us going and putting us, pinning us against each other. And um, I don't even think people even realized that <laughs> and knew that, but um, that was my little brother. And Bob was always competitive and always wanted to be the man and wanted to, you know, but he, it was, you know, whatever his personal feeling was, however he felt about me, all I'm saying is at the end of the day, we have, I never had to experience anything short of a brotherhood with him. Mm -hmm. That album debuted at number one. It was the first album the new edition dropped to debut at number one. So 227,000 his first week. Yeah. Uh, it also went number one on the R&B charts, which yeah. is the first time that they did that since their self-titled uh, album back in 84. Right. Um, so you have this monster project. Uh, hit Me Off was a huge hit. Yeah. Uh, I'm Still in Love With You. You Don't Have to Worry. One More Day. Shop Around. It, it was it was massive. It ended up going double platinum. Yeah. Uh, which I believe, is this the best-selling new edition album? No, the Heartbreak, I believe it is. Okay, so Heartbreak ended up being bigger. Yeah. But yeah. this is still a monster. Still a monster, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, how did you feel about this album? Um, it's funny because from an artistic standpoint, I I don't know if this was one of my favorite albums. Hmm. It I, was. I liked Heartbreak better. Yeah. I, it's just, I don't know. It just, you know, and that's the thing. That's why I said you can't, when you're in a different time, place, and space, you can never recapture that level of that of capture that magic where whatever that is 
And so sometimes you just got to go into a place where you continue to just go focus on the art. Express yourself. Where are you today? Who are you today? What is it you want to say today? And then you have to let the chips fall where they may. And so for me, when I listen back now to that album versus the Heartbreak album, I mean, I still, hands down, Heartbreak just, yeah. it's unanimous for me. Right. It, it's, you know. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But regardless, the fans loved it. Yeah. It was oh, yeah. a huge album. Yeah. And to, to celebrate the album, there was a big reunion tour. Yeah. Yeah, because it just it's been a while. It's right, good to see yeah. all six. Every, everyone, yeah. all six members, yeah. everyone's excited. Yeah. You're going on this huge tour, and then things go bad. <laughs> you think? So <laughs> apparently uh, Bobby Brown, being Bobby Brown, uh, I guess went too long on some of his songs, oh the way man. he usually does. It was brutal. And uh, Ronnie DeVoe, I guess, tried to pull him off the stage. Yeah, it was it was Bobby horrible. Brown dropped the mic in a fist fight. Yeah, fist <laughs> fight broke out. So you were right there when it happened. I was there when it, it happened. Explain to me what happened. Well, let me tell you how smart I am. <laughs> it was so crazy. The Heartbreak Tour was like a rock and roll. It was like we were like the rockers. Those, I mean, it was just insane. Everyone had their own bus. It was like, I think Ricky and I were the only two, <laughs> two out of the whole crew. I think I had three people on my bus. I think Rick might have had three, two or three people at the most on the bus. Everybody else on their buses had 10, 15, 20 people. You just be looking around going, who the Because all these people, like, it was like, it's like they was picking them up as they go from city to city to city. It's like. All the weed carriers. It was like, yeah, (laughs) dance. It's crazy. Yeah. But yeah, it was, uh, it had reached that point where, you know, I think Bob himself would probably have to, to explain that, but he was in a place where it was no secret. Everybody knew Bob was using. Yeah, and he had drug he problems. He was just he was in a not in a very good space and place. And obviously, you could see it. You could see it every night. I mean, watching him and you just go, "Wow!" You go, "Come on, man! You got to pull it together, man!" Like it's just, you know, it was. Well, well, yeah, because after the fist fight broke out, the security started to get involved and gunshots went gunshots. off. Right. Yeah, gunshots. No one and got hit, right? Oh, I, nobody got hit, but all I heard, gun. And all you had to tell me was gun. My ass was gone. I couldn't tell you right. what else that happened at that I point. Mean, I mean, it's a I concert. Was like, it's this it's is a bunch insane. of lifelong friends. Yeah. It's a group. Yeah. And now bullets are flying. But it wasn't. It's, it's just crazy. Brothers fight. We've listen, Yeah, but guns we've don't get history. pulled out in the process. Right. And I'm not had, saying that they pulled out guns, but the, but the security. We, you know? We've had a history of fighting, all of us as brothers. I mean, we've had issues where the rooms got tore up. It was just what it was, just siblings going at it. Um, but, you know, when you start getting all these people and gathering all these unfamiliar faces and you got people trying to prove I'm, I'm, uh, I'm you know, I'm Team Johnny, I'm Team Bobby, I'm Team Ronnie. You know, that's what happens when you start gathering people and we're not being conscious and aware, too, as, uh, of, of our surroundings and the people that we choose to hire and bring that's understanding that they are an extended part of us and they represent us. And so, yeah. And, you know. and, and to be fair, this is not the first time gunshots have gone off in regards to a new edition concert. Uh, Before no. you showed up, no, but, there was the whole situation. I mean, me, me and Teddy Riley talked about a situation where yeah. one of his people got killed, yeah. you know, because yeah. of yeah. someone was taking too long on their set. So something very yeah. trivial in the grand scheme of things, not enough for yeah. someone to lose their life over. But not this is, yeah. there's a history of bullshit yeah. Honestly, coming from Bobby Brown's camp. We seen on the news that uh, my best friend got killed. Anthony B. Anthony B. Yeah. And he was killed by one of New Edition's guys. Yeah. Um, oh. One of the production people. Yeah, yeah you know but you don't I mean, find but... it. Let's come on. Let's admit. <laughs> Uh, you don't find that going too much for R&B groups. Exactly. We so this first. is just odd. Like, you know what I mean? This is just crazy. Like, you know, <laughs> we were the first. Man, NWA you know, never like, man, y'all, y'all are crazy. Uh, I expect <laughs> NWA. It's like, right. what? Like, no, what? No addition. It's out here shooting up the club. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Yeah, I don't know, man. Well, hey, man. because of that, Michael Bivens and Bobby Brown left the tour. Yeah. Which left uh, you, yeah. uh, Ricky Bell, Ralph Tressman, and... Uh, Ryan DeVoe, yeah. to basically finish off finish the tour as a quartet. Yeah. Was that sort of weird? 
on it, this big reunion tour, homecoming, to just yeah, four people are left. It was. Two of them went home. But God bless my dear brother and my friend to this day, who I love to the core, Al Heyman. Al said, hey, man, whoever's ready to rock, let's go and get this and complete this and do what needs to be done because there was a lot of damage that was done. That's when I started having tax problems. Uh, all the guys had already, they had already had issues and tax problems. Well, right, because didn't New Edition go into debt oh, during that oh, tour? Yeah, 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 it got ugly. It got right. really ugly. And I looked around too and I'm going, oh, hell. I'm the only one that showed up and never missed a show out of everybody. Everybody missed the show at some point. Uh-huh. I'm the only one that showed up, never missed not a show. Why do you think everyone's going into debt? I mean, you guys are a multi-platinum group. The tours, I'm sure, are making tons of money because the tours were all sold out or Tons of money to was being out. made, but tons of money was being spent. And it was a lot going on, man. It's a big production. You. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, you look back and there was vendors, there was a bunch of people that we ended up at the end of the day owing uh, after the tour was over. It was crazy. When I tell you crazy, it was, if that was the first time I ever experienced that myself. And I was just sitting there thinking, I'm like, yo, this is crazy. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, uh, Ricky Bell, who I interviewed, uh, he was saying right around that time, things started getting bad for him. Yeah. He, he started getting deeper into his drug addiction. Uh, cocaine, oxy, alcohol. Uh, he almost died from yeah. a cocaine overdose. Yeah. Do you know, I, I didn't know any of that stuff didn't know any for the longest. Um, I mean, he lost his house. Yeah. I remember at one point, he, I think he was telling me in the interview, he had to sell his boots or something just to make a little bit of money. I mean, this is a multi-platinum, what, like a 10 times platinum artist having to sell his shoes yeah. just to get by. I don't, I, I mean, at that time, I still didn't know the significance, the depth of how bad it was or how strong the addiction was. Because the day that I got out, I called my dealer. After 30 days of rehab, I called my dealer. So you got out and got some more coke. Exactly. Wow. And so so for the last 16 years, it's been a, a, a thing of like, okay, I'll get six months sober, relapse, five years sober, relapse, you know, back and forth. Six different rehabs. Um, I don't know how many different relapses over the last 16 years. But even now, um, I sit here at two years and seven months sober. One time, I I remember selling my boots, my Timberland boots. Really? That had like, you know, like I I designed myself. They had like my initials and autograph and just something that I was just keeping. And I remember one day just looking around the house for whatever like finding old video cameras to whatever it is I could pawn, take to the pawn shop or give to the dealer to get 50 bucks worth or whatever. Wow. For me, that was like the lowest. And even then it was just, you know, like it didn't register to me at the time. Like, oh, this is low, like this is my bottom. But I ended up having to do the same thing. I had to sell my, I didn't end up, I didn't, lose my house, but I ended up having to sell it. It was like life, everything had just gotten to a point where it just gotten turned upside down. And I remember having to give up stuff from the studio stuff, the things of values that I did end up giving yeah. to the to the IRS as value, my cars, to all that stuff. And it was just like, I'm like, how the hell did I get here? Right. And what did this I do? This is something do? an unsuccessful artist is supposed to go through. Exactly. Not, not a multi-platinum artist. And I would have felt better at least if I had been doing drugs and was out here doing, then I could have, and I can go, hey. All right, it's hey, my fault. Me, you, yeah, exactly. But in this I'm case. I'm just sitting there going, yeah. shit, I didn't do nothing. Right. And you're <laughs> Besides broke. work. And, was and you're, and you're to, broke along with everyone else. I'm just like, man, this I mean, is crazy. So I mean, if you were to, at this point, at your age, looking back on it, what was it? Was it people stealing? Was it you guys, you not understanding the business? Was it, what was it? A lack of education, absolutely. Okay. Listen, if, if you think about, even at that point, at that time, we had to be in our 20s, I'm assuming. Uh, that was what year? That yeah, was you in, were uh, 31 at the time. 31, so I'm not 30. Yeah. Think about some young guys that comes from the projects, and even though I didn't come from the projects, the lack of education that we had about money. We didn't understand none of that stuff. And you could, if you go back and think about 
how much money went through our hands. Even if the record company had stolen from us and all the other things that have happened, the money we made on tour still was enough money that if you had was educated and had, you know, that at least under your belt, you still could have ended up, all of us could have ended up still being just fine. Yeah. You know, so it was a lack of education of understanding money and understanding how to handle the money. Because still through it all, we, there was a lot of money, millions that went through our hands. Well, but, yeah. And it's not like New Edition, this is the first time they had money problems. I remember their first tour, you know, me and Ricky were talking about this, how they went on this crazy sold out tour. They came back and got a dollar and 87 cents. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a check. They said a dollar and 87, which is the police code for murder, by the way. Which is My kind of ironic. But, you know, that's what I'm saying. Like they had been getting fucked up yeah, money wise yeah. and, and going through these issues wh all while selling millions of albums. So it's like by that time you would think that it would have gotten worked yeah, out, yeah, but yeah. yeah. No. And, and for me, I didn't have that issue. So yeah. you gotta understand my first time you got dragged into was doing thing, yeah. this home, home again. Yeah. And my dear brother and dear friend, Barry Bonds, I'll never Barry forget. Bonds, okay. Barry came to the house. We, Barry and I used to run, hang out. And, um, and I remember him coming to my house in Encino uh, years, uh, maybe a year or two even before that, before the home again stuff. And he goes, dude, there's a computer and it looks, this is what it does. And you could tap in to see all your stuff in your account and you could do this and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, I get out of here with that shit. And I was like, I, you know, <laughs> all of us, we used to think Barry was crazy because we was just like, he's just a, he's like a freaking nerd because we was thinking, you know, he used to talk about all this computer stuff. And it was like, and my thought, because I was just, uh, I was kind of like intimidated. Mm -hmm. All of us, it, most people, when you first, when we were first introduced to the, to that, with the computer world, we were intimidated by it because it looked like some stuff only nerds, so, some brainiacs could only identify with. Yeah. So for me, while he's trying to tell me about learning and getting connected where you could see if your accountant's taking any money out because you can tap into your, uh, into your account and blah, blah, blah. And he's sitting there giving me all of that stuff and I'm sitting there going, yeah, yeah, but I got a house full of girls and I'm going, Yo, let's get the party started. Shoot. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think twice about the yeah. stuff. Yeah. And he was the one that was trying to teach me and put me up on it, uh, on, on getting and understanding my finances. I look back later and we laugh about it to this day. He was like, dude, I tried to. I was like, shut up. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, after the whole, the whole fiasco of the tour, after that, you formed LSG. Yeah. Levert, Sweat, and Gil. Now, was this a kind of a playoff LSD? Uh, no, it's just ironically that was how the well, last. It could have been, been GSL. It could have been SLG. I mean, when I first saw LSG, I said, "Oh, you know, this sounds like LSD." <laughs> That's what I thought. That's what I thought. <laughs> no, it was just a little odd story. LSD actually changed was the actually of my Keith's life. idea. Originally, it was supposed to be Keith, Gerald, and R. Kelly. Oh wait, and, wait, wait! Really, R. Kelly yeah, was supposed to be part of this some kind of way. Uh, Rob pulled out of it from what I was told. And I know Gerald had talked to me and he was like, man, Keith wants to do like a group thing. So, you know, he was like, he wants to, you know, see what, what, you know, what it's like. And I told him, you know, you got to do this. We're going to have to do that. Blah, blah, blah. And so, and that's when, you know, he said, man, he, he, and we think that the three of us should be doing it. And he said, I suggested you anyway. <laughs> so it ended up being, uh, the three of us mm -hmm. doing LSG. And, uh, and even at that time, Keith was on fire and, and he said, Sylvia Rome was telling him, what the hell are you doing? Why are you doing it? Doesn't make any sense. I wouldn't do that if I was you. And he was like, nobody's telling me what to do. I want to do it. I'm going to do it. <laughs> and so he did. He did. Well, the album peaked at number four. Yeah. Uh, it went uh, double platinum. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. My Body became a huge hit. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it actually stayed stayed on the the Hot 100 uh, number four. Well, it stayed on there for three weeks, so it had a had a great run. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it had a great it had run. A great, uh, I yeah. think it was like it was only because uh, Elton John's "Candle in the Wind" that it didn't go like yeah. number one yeah. <laughs> at the time. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Puffy worked on it. Uh, Jermaine Dupri Three, was on it. Yeah. The Locks, Faith Evans, Coco, Missy, Missy Elliott, Elliott yeah. LL Cool J was on a song. Yep. Busta was on a song. MC Light. MC Light. Yep. Yeah. yeah, man, yeah. it was it was All a dope it was a dope project, and really like three very established R and B guys came together and formed a super group. Which yeah. had that been so done like the three at the tenors. time? Sort of like the three tennis, but um, no, 
that was the first not time. Not in the R&B world. Yeah, but the three tenors, you're right. But that, yeah. that was classical. Right, right. Opera. But it was like the, was opera, I, the yeah. idea, the concept was kind of like the, yeah. you know, yeah. And, and um, yeah, it, 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 it was hugely successful. And yeah. man, we was taking off and, uh, and it was so funny watching the dynamics between uh, Keith and Gerald because they used to go at it like, oh my God, that was his brother. And you could tell they were like, you know, you know, it was a brotherhood thing, but they used to go, and I had the front row seat. And I'd be sitting there going, <laughs> ooh, <laughs> ooh, ooh. <laughs> and they'd just be going at it. And I'd just be sitting here going. <laughs> and Gerald had a, a, listen, man, Gerald's voice was so strong that if we was in this room, with that door closed, I swear to you, outside your front door, you could still hear him when he starts screaming. Oh, yeah. <laughs> His voice was like no, freaking. He, yeah, yeah. Joe Laverne has him, a powerful him. voice. Oh, my powerful God. Powerful voice. That was my road dog and my partner in crime, man. Oh, my goodness. Well, that next year, 98, didn't MCA sue New Edition? We sued them, and I think they countered. They countered. We've been in the situation for 40 years years as no addition under contract that's been amended over and over time time again and been adjusted to however you want to do with it different situations but has still put us and has gotten us even to this day we have one of the worst contracts that there is that any probably most any artist could have that we've 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 been trying to have um we've sent several lawyers in to try to sit and talk with trying to just renegotiate and get us and be fair with us and especially now even after 40 years we've earned that we're still fighting today well cuz in 2004 didn't new edition get their masters back from MCA no no, that's wrong. No, we never got. The, we didn't get the masters. Oh, back. Okay, no, sorry, my, no, my mistake. It's, we and so the fight continues forty years later, so where we're still, still asking, can we just just make it right with us? We're not saying just make. We have put in forty years, and we're fighting still to this day, and we're still at this point in a position wow. where they're going get out of here. We don't want to talk to you, and no, we're not doing anything. Well, is, isn't there uh, a law? That that started getting enacted some years back, maybe around 2019, 20. Because I remember my lawyer, who's a music lawyer, was telling me about this, how after 25 years, you're supposed to get your master's back. Yeah. And we're doing those things. Now, we're yeah. getting all that stuff back. But you got to think back to a number of other things that we didn't have back during the day in those old contracts. Streaming was not, didn't even exist. Right. So a number of things that we're dealing with today and how we're still being treated is just, it's just not cool. It's, un it's unfair. Yeah. And, you know, you hate to sit and put yourself in a position where at the end of the day as, uh, as ic icons and, it's, and we've been able to, thank God, have made a living in other areas of our lives uh, financially that has bought us and keeps us uh, to uh, being able to take care of our families and do what we do. And so we're grateful for that. But when it comes down to that part mm -hmm. of our lives, still messed up, still not right. Yeah. Still not right. And it's, and it's, what is unfortunate, they don't even want to sit to really, unfortunately, to sit down and try to make it right. That's what's unfortunate. And we're still looking into it and trying to figure out how to do this because we think that is, you know, it's only fair that we're talking about at this point, 40 years later, Come on. Yeah. No, it's Make it up. fair. All we ask and just let's just just be fair. Make our your wrongs right with us. We know you can't everybody wasn't even here during the time when we first started and the, there's so many people that have come and gone through all of this and nobody's sitting here trying to have a war or fight. We're just trying to set a uh, a president to make sure people understand and just for us as icons in this business even after 40 years later that someone would come and looking for someone to come to the table over here on the other side to say, let's sit down and try to respect you guys and understand what you guys have done, the impact that you guys have made in this industry. And let's sit down and try to see if we can come to some kind of 
common ground here to, to make you guys, to make it right. I, we can never make it all right, but we, we, des- you guys deserve at least something to, you know, and it's just, it's, it's, it's sad to see, but there's a business that we're still operating under and the mindset sometimes of the, of, 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 of these, uh, uh, of, of the, um, you know, these labels, it's just, it is what it is. And we got to continue to keep fighting. Yeah. And we just keep trying to do it in a manner that we want to do it the right way. 2003, you dropped the second LSG album, LSG 2. Uh, hit number six on Billboard. Didn't do as, as big as the, the previous album. Man. But it did. So, I mean, number six on Billboard is no joke. Oh, still did, yeah. Did it go platinum? It's still considered, yes, it was still platinum. considered success. Absolutely. Why was that the last, out, last uh, LSG album? Uh, because, of course, obviously, we're all solo artists, and yeah. Keith had to get back to his business. Gerald had to get back to his. I had to get back to mine. Then you got to remember, I was with uh, being in a group with an audition on top of all that stuff, trying to get. So it was always, but I've always, <laughs> they call me a chameleon. <laughs> I'm just like, you know, got to work behind, call me. I'm in. Solo, so, this group, yeah, that group, was, duet with my girlfriend, yeah, whatever. I'll, stage, I'll do it all. I'm like, <laughs> listen, I just always felt like that's, I wanted to build uh, a legacy and not be considered or looked at as being a one-trick pony. And for me, um, it was important uh, to continue to add to my legacy, just doing different things. Uh, I still don't get the respect that I feel I deserve. I still don't get um, and haven't gotten honors. Honors because of 40 years, the work I've put in, the things I've been able to do that I've set um, the bars for, uh, when it comes down to just even as an artist, uh, whether it was Heads of State, myself, Bobby, and Ralph, uh, whether it was LSG, whether it was New Edition, whether it was Johnny Gill, whether it was Johnny Gill and Stacey Lattice, so this 40 years here that I've put in, and guess what I've always done? I've, I've, I've carried uh, my side of the bargain of being um, a committed artist um, and doing it with grace, doing it with respect, upholding and trying to uphold that bar for those that are coming behind me and have done it for 40 years. You don't stay in this business for 40 years by a coincidence. Well, at one point, New Edition leaves MCA and you guys sign with Bad Boy. Yeah. And you guys come out with your seventh album, One Love. Yeah. Which Puffy had his hands all over. Um, (laughs) Hot Tonight was a single that did pretty well but from what i understand you guys were not happy with that album no no, why is that the process of making the album uh was really um a bit difficult okay bobby brown wasn't in the group no bobby was in the group at that time i think uh we thought or the group did, I didn't. Because, listen, I, I, I'd i been knowing Puffy before the guys knew Puffy. And uh, it's so funny because, you know, um, uh, I'll never forget, uh, I, we did, I, I invited him to the fight. We was all recording and I bought, bought, uh, invited him to one of the fights. I forgot what fight it was. It was many, many years ago. And that was the first time that he had ever been introduced to being on the jet. And I remember watching him. It was the funniest thing to watch him on the jet. And he's like looking around like this. And it's like, he was like, you know, and that was his first time ever mm. being on the jet. Now all he does is fly private. All right, that's all he does. And you owe me, Puff. <laughs> hey, man, I listen, man. Come on. <laughs> right. But, yeah, I remember I, I've never like, seen Puffy in first class. <laughs> all, the, all the first class fights I took, he, he never sat next to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was so funny because, and we had, we ended up button heads. And I remember we was getting into it. We was arguing had this big spat with all of us and mainly, mainly me and him. And so I remember, him, him, I remember he called me and once I got back to the hotel and he called me, he's like, yo, man. He goes, like, 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 like that, that was embarrassing, man. And I, you know, to, for, for us, you know, to be carrying on like that in front of everybody like that. And he's like, cause he said, you know, he was just saying, I, 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 I know you better than I know them and I've been knowing you longer and mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. And so we were just talking and I said, and I remember saying to him, and he said, man, you took me on my first private ride jet and all that stuff. And I said, I get all of that, uh, um, Puff. I said, but 
you know, this is a business that we're operating in. And I said, and at the end of the day here, this is how we make our living and how we feed our families. And we just don't feel like we're in a place where we're being treated in the level at the level that we all feel like we should be, be being treated as. And I said, and this is how we make our living. So, yeah. you know, and that, when it comes down to how it affects how we got to feed our families, it's personal. And I said, so, you know, yeah. but we went through all of that. And we, of course, clearly, me and him at that point began, you know, uh, it got not cleared and, and had a clear understanding as we began to try to move forward to finish up uh, recording the album. So, and we did, we did, but it was just, um, you don't know if something's going to work until you know. And at the end of the day, for us, being there at Bad Boy, understanding that um, ultimately, really, that was Puff's house. And, um, and it was really still about the fact that it was about Puffy. But in retrospect, let's still do this and say this. He provided us an opportunity. And that could never be overlooked. And we all have to, myself too, have to be grateful because though it did not work, um, the fact that he had an interest in us and provided us an opportunity when we were still sitting, still in a bad situation with, oh, at, at the MCA label to say, hey, you guys, let's come over here. And he was interested in seeing how, what he can do and get, and getting us off the ground as well. That can't be overlooked. Yes, the way we went through the working process probably was uncomfortable and wasn't what we was used to. But ultimately, overall, when you put it in perspective, um, there's a great level of respect for the fact that he, what he did and like giving us that opportunity to see, okay, maybe this might be a road we could take to get you guys to where you want to be. So, Well, yeah, and a few years later in 2008, you formed uh, Heads of State, which is you, Ralph, and Bobby Brown. Yes. It's really interesting how you have this musical chairs of groups within the group. Yeah. You got Bill Bill DeVoe, you got Heads of State. Yeah, Heads of State. That was the Republicans against the Democrats. Yeah. <laughs> you got all, That's what we all used the to solo, in time. All the solo stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> later on you had Ronnie, Bobby, Ricky, and Mike. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's just this, yeah. this interesting kind of hodgepodge of subgroups within the group and, and everything else like that. Um, different combinations. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's crazy as it might sound. I think that's a part of what has made this group so deep when it comes down to people trying to figure out with the six of us, it's, you know, it's a nucleus. When we all six of us together, it's because there's so much history. There's so much that we've done together and collectively, individually and collectively. And when you put it all together and you see it all come together and sitting in front of you, all six of us, of what we've done and been able to accomplish. It's um, it's pretty powerful. Yeah. Pretty powerful. And then in 2011, 15 years after your last solo album, you came back with Still Winning. Yeah. Uh, which actually uh, hit number 17 on the yeah. Billboard 200. Quite an accomplishment considering the time. That uh, You're 45 at the time. A bunch of time had passed yeah. between your last solo album, a bunch of time yeah. had passed since the last big new edition album, and yet you did your thing on it. In yeah. the mood, when you know, did well. Movie. It would be, oh, no, it would be you, I'm sorry. With uh, that Trey songs. Mm -hmm. uh, it was one of his yep. records that he'd done, and I was like, give me that boy. Yep. This belonged to some grown folks over here, boy. That's right. Come on, that boy. <laughs> that was him singing back right. when I was on it, too. They left. But, was, uh, that, was that the same year that uh, you had a son? That was, gosh, that was 2000. 2011? 11. No, because Isaiah was born 2006. He's 17 now, so 2006. Isaiah was six. born. Okay, yeah. got it. Sorry, yeah, I got 17. the timeline a little bit wrong. Yeah. And uh, you said that was a, a hard thing because you and Isaiah's mom lived on different coasts. Yeah, and I that was the first time, my first experience of having a, my, my son having a kid and started realizing that my goodness, my goodness, that um, I grew up, even though my mom and dad split up, I still understood and knew what it was and what it meant to have a mother and a father in a home. Yeah. And because his mom and I was never 
together. Yeah, you, you guys know? never in a real relationship, yeah. right? So. so it was just right. You lived in L.A., she lived on the East Coast. Yeah. So then you'd have to kind of fly the kid back and yeah. forth, and, and yeah, it's not an ideal of situation. That and watching my kid just reaching up when he couldn't even talk, could, couldn't even walk, and he's reaching up when I gotta hand him over to go to his mom because she's taking him back. And it's like, ah, it was the, I, I still see 17 years later, I see this vision of this kid just reaching like, you know, I don't want to leave that daddy. And that's like, and I said to myself, I would never, ever, ever do that again in life. Have a kid without trying, at least nothing is guaranteed, but to have another kid and having one in a home with a mom and a dad to be raised. And that's the only child that you have? The only, yeah. Got it. Yeah, yeah. But well, didn't you say, I remember I read, there was an interview somewhere where, it, I don't think it was this relationship, but it was a, someone you were involved with. And because of the gay rumors, you actually did a, a polygraph test with her? Yeah. That's yeah, wild, yeah, man. Yeah. That's wild to have to actually go through that extent she never, to show that you're straight. Like that, that's crazy it was, to me. You know, it was crazy because it had, the, the rumor had been going for so long. Yeah. And so you start to realize and look at certain things. Like I said, like a record label, they was talking to record label. They're like, well, we would, but I think, uh, you know, he's, isn't he gay? So we don't want to, it's like, so we see here, it's all this stuff that's going. And I remember her telling me, um, about her, some friends, her friends saying this and saying that and blah, blah, blah. She never asked me to do it, but I wanted to show her something. I wanted to prove a point to her. I said, you know, it's crazy how people will sit and talk. They're like, people are like parrots. <laughs> they will talk as if they know something and repeat it and as all, and like they've seen it or been there or seen it's like and what I wanted her to understand was I said you know she never asked me to do it I said you know I'm doing this because I want to show you and prove something to you about people even your own so-called friends I said you know um I I took a part we, we call I called this I looked in the yellow page so I just <laughs> found the company from out of nowhere and I had them come over I said and I told her, I said, right, you write down all your questions. And, I'll, and any questions, I'm going to write down questions. Have I ever been with another man? Have I ever thought about another man? I went to all, I, we did it all. Because I just wanted to. And I remember when we got the, the, got the results back and she read them and she saw it was all. It was all what, bullshit. Yeah. And we laid there in the bed. I'll never forget. And uh, I was so full at one point that I thought tears was going to come down, but it, I was saying to her and wanted to show her that this is why you have to watch people and be careful about the dogs that bring the bones because nobody cared less about whether that could have affected our relationship and care or would wake up and go, I wonder if Johnny or is Carissa happy today, even though we broke them up because we told her because they could care less, could care less. Yeah, and man. So, and it's, I, it's, it's, it's a messed up. World it's a messed up world in. we live it's in. To have world. to do all that. I, I've never had to do anything remotely And she like never that. asked me, yeah. but I did it because I wanted her. To, and I was like, I don't want to lay next to someone that you might think maybe at some point one day you've been hearing so much that you might think, well, maybe it might be. And maybe there is, you know. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to. And I did that simply because of me, but she never asked me. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you proved a point. I think. uh I remember we were talking to Russell Simmons uh, a little while back, and when he had all the accusations of the the sexual assaults yeah. and everything, everything else like that, he went and got his daughters and did a polygraph test with his daughters there just to show them yeah. that like this is all bullshit. Yeah, and yeah, yeah I know people don't documentary care. about me and whatever on HBO, but this is all bullshit. And let me show you the polygraph test. It's crazy because people don't care. They don't care if they impact. Just even my mom. And the reason why when we get back to the gay stuff that makes me feel so bad to talk about it, because I'm, listen, this is not just about the rumors of somebody being gay, because I got too many gay friends and I would never walk in front of or behind them. Yeah. And I, I have gay friends. Treat, I have gay you employees. Treat everybody it's all with, good, man. Yeah, and, and do listen, what you want to do, be man. Live your life. Be. But what it makes you feel like when you have to speak or defend yourself, it's like that, like that's the only thing that I would have been, I would be fighting. Or, or sound might sound horrible to me that I'll fight. I'm fighting for 
But it's not just that. It's the fact that if you're talking about, if even if I, you want to call me an habitual liar or a thief, I would be sitting here and if that was a running uh, thing about my character that is not true, I'd be sitting here defending that for years if that's what, if it had been just yeah. even that. Nobody wants to be accused of something that they're not. Mm -hmm. I don't care whether it's a thief, whether it's your know, sexual preference to whatever the case it is. So I've always thought about the fact that my character and who I am and why and what was most consistent with what you would be, somebody would be accusing you of. And it's like, hey, motherfuckers, that's not who I am. What's fuck is wrong with you? But that was just the part of why I've always, and I feel like when I was defending myself and you defend yourself, it's like, and I don't want somebody to, under, to take a mis, misstep and make it as misstep and saying that, well, what's wrong with being gay? It's like, because there's nothing wrong with being gay. That's who you are. Right. It's but just not accurate. There's something wrong with somebody accusing you of being something or someone that you're, that you're not. not. Exactly. Well, 2012, you're on tour with New Edition and Whitney Houston dies. Oh, that was a brutal day. My God. My God. Uh, and Bobby Brown is right there. Ooh, man. Now they're, they're separated at the time, but still. That's our sister. It's, yeah. That's our sister. Didn't uh, Listen, um, even when they were separated, we still see each other and hang out because she would still come over to the house, mom, uh, Pop Brown's house and uh, stuff. So it was never like just even because they were apart that we didn't see her or she, she was no longer part of the family. You know, so, man, we were, I, I, my goodness, I, everything was like a, like a, a haze. I, it's just even remembering hearing the words that that had happened. And we're at the building for sound check. And that comes, you get the word and you're just going, God, please tell me this is a joke. Please tell me this is a joke. Please tell me this is a joke. Whew, man. That was brutal. Yeah. That and um was brutal. I think some of the, you know, when you look into the story, you know, for example, I, I had read when I was reading the stories about Whitney at the time that she had died and they did the autopsy, um, she was missing like half of her teeth. You know what I'm saying? Her, her drug addiction had gotten so far that she was literally half of her teeth were gone. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it always, you know, a lot of times Bobby was blamed for the addiction in that family. But yeah. a, a lot of times, you know, from what I heard, Whitney was the one that actually got addicted early and, and kind of got Bobby on that as well. And then Bobby tried to separate himself a little bit and she kept going. Much respect to, to her brother who finally set the record straight because Bobby had to wear that one. Right. He was always years, blamed for, blamed for taking for, this yeah. princess and of America yes. and somehow corrupting her. But her, there was, her brother, that's not really the story. Her brother set the record straight. Yes. And um, so grateful for that because, yeah, he had to wear that for many, many years. And now, make no mistake about it, Bob had his own challenges. Yes. But it didn't come from him bringing her, in, bringing her into it. Yes. You know, that was not the case. And he, uh, he was... You know, I had to wear that, uh, was accused of that for many, many years. Yeah. Well, right. And then four years later, his daughter died. Yeah. Were you guys together when that happened? Uh, no, I was, where was I? I was somewhere when that happened. And I'm trying to think, was I on the road? I might have been on the road or something because I remember when I called him. I called him and, um, Uh, he was torn apart because, you know, even during that time, they had just, their, their relationship was estranged for, was estranged for, a, for a while. And they had just really, uh, was starting to kind of bond back in and starting to, you know, to, to hang and communicate and all that stuff. So it was just like, man, it was, that's what was so brutal about it because they were just getting to that point, back yeah. to that place. And, uh, it was just, uh, you know, that's how, listen, it's our niece. <laughs> yeah, and, no, I, I interviewed uh, uh, and, Landon, Bobby's yeah, son. It, my dad's not a super emotional person. Mm -hmm. My dad can react a kind of way, in, you know, to a scenario when it happens. When it occurs, he's ready for it. So his first thing to say to me was, you know, where are you? What are you doing? Okay, you're far. 
where's your sister? Immediately. So we're on the same page. Because as much as I want to react to her passing, that's not, that's not what I can do anything about. It's, it's done, it's gone, it's over. I need to figure out where my sister is, who's around her, because if she's around some idiots, this is not gonna be okay for my sister. As traumatized as she probably is right now, someone around her can make it that much worse. Yeah, and it's like it was just one tragedy after another, after another, after another for, for one guy. And, you know, you sit down and you try to figure out what is it that's going on here that, you know, because we all got to go through life where we're going to have and lose loved ones. That's just a part of life. But the things that was going on with him, you had to sit down and go, what? Yeah, like, no, why? No, people were checking out early, way too yeah. early in his life. Yeah. You know, uh, Whitney was not that old. And yeah. his daughter was extremely young. Yeah. So yeah. so it, it was just, yeah, I can't imagine what Bobby went through during that time. I, I just, I can't, I can't get my head around it. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> to me, I, I look at life and I put, to try to put it all in perspective and understand that, you know, sometimes we keep assuming that everyone comes here on this planet and we're all supposed to be, live this long life. And of what we consider and define, you know, we, you know, a long life is, you know, living to your old, old, and that's not necessarily so. It and it begins to. We were both in our fifties, and I consider myself lucky yeah. to have made it to fifty. Yeah, yeah I turned fifty June twenty eighth. You yeah. know, wow. Like I, I consider myself lucky yeah. because I, I have lots of friends that didn't that, that make didn't it. make it. That didn't make this it. far. Yeah. I've interviewed lots of people who yeah. who didn't make it make it to half my age. Yeah. So yeah. so it's it's yeah man it's 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 crazy. In life and, I yeah. think for most of us we get so comfortable and so content and so so we just take life for granted that we really believe and think that we're all supposed to come here and oh, supposed yeah. to be here yeah. and unless you, you live a full life grow old that you know yeah no growing old is a gift yes a gift is. and not everyone is, is given that gift, given that gift and, I, and I, I think about that a lot and I, that's not know, everyone's this is why i try to stay healthy i lost weight i, yeah. I you know i exercise every day because yeah. because otherwise Give you man, listen I, I have a close friend who i grew up with who's the same age and he's missing half his teeth yeah. like you know because of drug use yeah. through you know cocaine use throughout his life like I, I i've seen it i see what happens if you could constantly yeah. abuse yourself it, it doesn't it doesn't end up very well, right. by the yeah. time you start to get older. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 2017, the new edition uh, story biopic comes out. And I guess you guys have been working on it for like 11 years. Long time. Long time. Three-part miniseries. I loved it, by the way. I, I would say that's the best TV biopic that I've ever seen. Wow. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. When you get into yeah. movies, you you know yeah. then you got Ray. Yeah. Yeah. Movies, that's that's a hard that's a hard one to get past. But on TV, yeah, you guys you guys have the crown for just the best yeah. put together biopic. The Bobby Brown biopic it, was good as well, but but this one had was like magical because yeah. it had so many all the members and everything else like that. Yeah. Um, Luke James played you. That's my dog. Right. That's my little you know? dog. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure him playing a gay character on the shy doesn't help. <laughs> With your there, go, there go Johnny. I told you. See, he told you. Go play him. He's playing gay character on the show, so that makes him gay. There we go. I'm connected the dots. Bingo. Bingo. Right here. Give me my prize. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. But, no, but, but that was just a a great a great series. Um, yeah. The premiere was watched by 4.2 million people, which makes makes that was BT's most watched premiere. Yeah. Since. The game came out like back in 2012. Yeah. yeah. Um, the final episode episode was like four million viewers. Um, really, just a crazy. great, well received piece. Very well put together. Shout out to to Wood Harris. Yeah, who can play the damn the near any character. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My boy Tank, and Gerald Busby. Yeah. I was oh like, yeah, Tank was in it. You're we right. Was, yeah. We was laughing about that not too long ago. I was like, every time I see him, I just go Gerald. <laughs> yep. It's my man. Yeah, yeah. Now, after that, wasn't there supposed to be a tour, but it got canceled due to some trademark issues or, or something? And yeah, we that, that's when the Ronnie, Bobby, Ricky, and Mike thing had to come together because yeah. what? Someone owed the copyright or trademark yeah. to, and they wouldn't uh, let you use it? Someone, or? I. <laughs> what happened? Um, we have, 
I think I said this to you earlier when the, when I just came in about uh, our brotherhood and us coming full circle and this group and our brotherhood has come full circle. In our 40 years, we have had some trials, some ups and downs. We've had some battles, uh, internal issues that we would have and against with each other. Mm -hmm. And it was never, it was no secret. But then again, yes, it was because we never would put our dirty laundry out with our internal issues that we have yeah. as, as, as brothers. And I remember we were still at that point arguing and bumping heads. And I never forget, I think uh, my lawyer might've called me and said, Hey, and said, Hey, uh, there's a, do you know nobody owns the name, uh, the new edition, blah, blah, blah. And uh, you guys should grab it before somebody gets at it. And so we just, let's just put it in a couple of you guys' name. And then, you know, you guys, um, can deal with that. And I said, yeah. I said, but then just put it in me and Ralph's name and then we'll deal, we'll talk to the guys. And the reason why I did that was because we had, and the guys will tell you even to this day now, that I said, before we make sure, before everybody puts their names on this and have, which we know belongs to everybody. Yeah, all six people. Here's what I think we need to do that covers everybody. Let's do an agreement amongst all six of us so no one individual can use the name that it will always be us collectively. Okay. So That's if one person doesn't join the tour, then you can't be new edition? Is that kind of what it means? Right. So it just means that, yeah, no one person can go out and say that, you know how you have four the, the, the sets of the, the temptation, the three sets of the, of the, the of these groups, they would have their own little temptation yeah. review. It's all that stuff. It was like, yeah, you, you want to keep it. It always, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I said, let's put that level, of, put that agreement in place before and get everybody to agree to that, to sign off so that we'll always uphold this level and the integrity and the value of this group called New Edition. Okay. It turned into all hell <laughs> on the fact that it's like, we, we, and they trying to take the name. It was like, we're going, what the hell? Trying to take the name. No, no, no. We're trying to make sure we protect. Protect the name. The name. Protect okay. it. So are you guys now touring as New Edition? Yeah. Well, okay, so it all yeah. got worked out. Oh, no, absolutely. But it was always. But at that time, were, you couldn't piggyback off the, the BET series. Right, because we were having. Because we you were, guys were trying to. Button heads uh, with all the other stuff. And it was just bad. like, well. Yeah. And, you know, of course, at that point, Ralph was like, I'm not, I don't want to go and mess with these guys right now. And I was like, okay, that's what it is. And then the guys were like, oh, no, well, why are we going? And then it was all that stuff. But that's the internal stuff that happens with groups and business of stuff. Right. But I'm saying overall, all it was <laughs> in the simplest form was let me, I'm the oldest in the group. And I've always felt like those are my little brothers. And listen, we could fight all day long, but anybody comes across that line to do anything or to begin to, to, mm -hmm. to offend or to, to hurt any one of my brothers. I've always felt like I'm the oldest and it is my job and my duty to make sure I protect my brothers. And so that was what, that was all that was behind that whole thing. And it was like, until we all come to an agreement to making sure everybody understands this is what we're going to do, how we're going to protect the integrity and the value of this group by making sure all of us are in agreement with ours, with this. And I was like, well, we'll just sit here until we can get it together and we can figure it out. But this is to protect you and keep everybody from having to have four or five different versions of a new edition out. Right. Yeah. Cause RBVM ended up going on tour. Yeah. Ronnie, Ron yeah. Bobby, Ricky, yeah. and Mike, yeah. Ronnie, uh, RBRM. Yeah. But that's all it was. And, and everybody understood that later after all of the smoke clear where we, you know, we had these conversations. We, for the longest time, for many years, had we always wanted the same thing. All of us always wanted the same thing. We want to be recognized. We wanted to be acknowledged. We still feel to this day, we still haven't gotten, gotten our just due and the respect that we honestly deserve uh, individually and collectively. And, you know, so you're always fighting. You're always fighting, figuring out if we do this, this is the way I think we got to do it. And this is the way I think we should do it. And this is the way everybody's got their different ways of how they think things should be done. But the ultimate thing about us is that we all we all want the same thing, and so yeah. that's part of the process when you're dealing with everybody having the same uh, having the same goals, but feeling like they have different ways. Everybody's got the different style of how they do things. 
But right. you know, it's that's a part of the process, a part of the, the the business process of it. But it was a blessing, man, that we reached a point where one day, um, I had I had a conversation with three of the guys, and Michael and I. It was never no secret. Michael Bivens and I, we had such great respect for each other, and we were the main ones. With well, he brought work. you in. Yeah, we would all. Matter of fact, Ralph, you got in. Me and Ralph, we came so close right. that we would be button heads. Ralph and I, I mean, Mike and I would be button heads, and it was just so funny. But I was always, and they'll tell you to this day, I was always the oldest brother, so I was always the one that was standing in here trying to figure out how to make it make sense. <laughs> and now you guys are. Still doing the legacy tour? We're done. done You're done. The okay. Legacy tour. Right. Legacy tour, which uh, with Keith Sweat was opening up for you guys, which yeah. is an interesting uh, LSG. Guy and, you know, and, uh, and Tank, Tank yeah, and Guy, yeah, my yeah. man. It was You fun. know, my yeah, man was, Teddy Riley, who I've interviewed before. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, which is like kind of like Guy used to tour around with the original new edition. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. So, and we bought the original Guy back. So it was Aaron, Damien, and uh, Teddy. And uh, mm -hmm. that was, you know, do you know how exciting that was for us? Because we, you know, we, we've all been in that circle yeah. and come up in the same circle. So it was like to be able to see that come full circle too was, that was truly just amazing, man. Crazy. Amazing. It was crazy. But it was fun. And, and even for us and our relationship, uh, the group, you know, something I, I really feel is important that I want to stress to all uh, these groups out here because everyone seems to think that going solo and the issues that you have with these groups w with each other that um it is um uh you know it's it, you know you, you 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 keep having these things where it's like fuck you and fuck you and I'm going on and I ain't got to do it and I don't need you and you don't need me even in our group we don't need each other we all still been able to make a living uh individually yeah you know and and do quite well but we have yeah. often said we're more powerful. Uh, uh, we're like a nucleus when we're all together. And, and, and that's important. And what I learned from my own group that I would love to give that's great advice to these other groups out here that I began to understand even more. Um, Michael and I, like I was saying, we used to butt heads more than anybody. Um, and, we sat down one day and had conversations. I remember, I'll never forget it happened when Kobe's pl plane went down. Mm. Yeah. I sat back and I thought about it and I said, what would any one of us have done if we had gotten that call and one of us was no longer here? And I remember sitting there thinking, all the stuff that we sit and butt heads and argue about and disagree with, how much would it really mean if that phone call, we had gotten that phone call, or if we got that phone call and one of us is no longer here? I mean, it happened to the Migos, right? Remember, Offset was separated from the group, they were yeah. beefing, and then Takeoff gets killed. Yeah. And then that's it. Yeah. The, no one had a chance to reunite, to, to right. squash it. it. It probably was yeah. not all that serious. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. So and, now, we, and now it's done. Yeah. yeah. And so Mike and I, uh, uh, he's the, he's the leader of his party and I was the leader of my party. And it's like, we come together and sit down and we had three, four, five hours of a conversation on the phone going, here's what I don't like about you. Here's what I thought of you. Here's what somebody said. And we went through all of that for probably about three or four hours for, and talked about just the history of stuff. Well, you know, these things that he was like, I bet you, you didn't know that blah, 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 blah. And we was just having this conversation. Wasn't going at each other. We was just talking and. Yeah. And from that day forward, we started um, communicating where we would just some kind of way naturally just happen where we started. We would just be calling each other. And then we didn't even want nothing. Wasn't talking about no business. Wasn't talking about no anything. Just whether it was a game or about the kids, the, you know, what the kids doing and blah, 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 and all this stuff. Stuff that we didn't do for years because we was just all, everybody was. And I began to watch the connection between me and him that came full circle. And today you can't tear me and him apart. It's like, it's impossible. Love it. And, you know, and what I did was with the other guys, we sat down finally and I realized, I kept saying, what is it and why is it that we all want the same thing, but yet we still cannot seem 
we couldn't seem to figure out how to come together on the business of stuff. Then I realized it came to me. <laughs> I sat down with the three of them, Ronnie, Rick, and Mike. And I said, here's what I believe is a problem. Everyone wants to be heard. Everyone needs to be heard. Everyone wants to have a voice. You got to understand what we were doing with each other, and most people do, which is not, which is pretty normal. You just do. Somebody says something that you don't agree with and sounds crazy. The first thing you go, that motherfucker must be crazy. <laughs> that sounds that there's no, do you know what that would do if we did that? Bah, 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 bah. And what I learned, what I learned from that, and I understood and took from that when I, when it all came to me, I, it was about understanding that no matter whether what, what a person says, if it's, it might be the craziest idea that they have. And I, but you can't be dismissive to people. It has to be where you have to respect them. And, and even if you disagree or you might be thinking in your head, you still have to allow them to speak and learn that you have to be respectful and understand that you cannot be dismissive to people when they want to talk or want to be heard or they have ideas. It is important that you hear from every individual and then we sit together collectively and figure out, okay, what's the best way if you guys think we should do this? And once I began to see when we all came together collectively and we would have these conversations about these challenges of stuff and somebody would be cutting somebody up, I go, whoa, 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 let, let them finish. Mm. Let them finish. And then you can talk. And as we began to practice that and exercise that and going down the line with allowing each individual to talk, whether it was crazy or not, and we might be thinking in your mind, what? But you still respect it and allow them and then said, okay, let's sit down and listen to figure out which way we should ultimately go with this. It allowed everybody that to be heard. And then at the end of the day, all of us started going in the direction where we go, okay, what do, you, what, do you, what do you think? What do you guys think? And whoever and whatever the majority was that we ruled, you would go, okay, cool. If that's what y'all want to do, I'm, you know, and it, it wasn't a problem. Why? Because it reached a point where everybody felt like they were being heard. Everybody felt like they had a voice and that they had some level of value. And that allowed us to be able to come in a place to come together to work where we've had, we haven't had no hit records. We haven't had no hit movies in the last two or three years. None of that stuff. We've had our biggest uh, success of doing what we've been doing in our last 40 years doing this, but coming together. When you can reach a point with, I'm a gambling man, I like gambling, you know, just having fun. That's my, that's a, to have someone to reach a point where you could tell me that this group would end up someday where when we would leave coming on our last day of tour, we all looking at each other going, damn, man, I'm gonna miss you. Mm. Damn, I'm gonna miss you, man. Man, I hate for this to end. Yeah, listen, I would have lost everything I owned. Somebody told me one day we would be at that point in our lives with our careers as brothers, that we would reach that place. And it has been truly a blessing to watch our brotherhood come full circle. We talk and hang and talk about sports and calling each other and dealing with the kids' birthdays and stuff. Um, like just now growing up a siblings where it's not about necessarily we even call it talking about business. And I mean, each, all of us to want each other. So it's not like it's just me and Ralph or might be just me and Mike. I mean, me and Rick or Ron or somebody, we all just, you know, have reached that level um, in our brotherhood. And I realized, I said, this was about respect. And this was about respecting the next man and understanding how um, everybody wants to be heard. And then I realized that even in the arguing, when you see people argue, they, it gets loud because even no matter if somebody's right, another person might be wrong. Even if you're right, the person can't hear you when they're on the defense. Yeah. So at some point, you have to learn. And that's why it gets loud because they're trying to be heard. Yeah. So to sit and learn mm -hmm. how to, to put yourself in a position to sit, whether you agree to disagree, to listen and hear someone out. And then when they're done, then to say, okay, are you done? I, I hear what you're saying. Here's my thought, but here's blah, 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 but I get, and then for them to do the same thing and hold them accountable to tell them, say, no, I just, I let you talk and I ask you where you're done. So I was respectfully, can you just let me finish and just hear me out? It gives you so much of an even ground and playing field to be able to figure out what's happening and can we come to and find a solution.
I love it. I love it. Well, Johnny Gill, man, That's thank you so much. That's for all, all the groups. All the groups that are sitting for here. All the groups, for all the teams, and going for all against the each other and trying to just everyone. respect, yes. learn to respect each other. And you ain't, you can agree to disagree. It just falls apart when you have, uh, when you just become dismissive and making people feel like they don't have a voice and that they don't have any value because you know it all and you have it all. It's like, yeah, yeah you know, we're older now for all you groups. Mm -hmm. 112, all you guys listen to me clearly. <laughs> we got more days behind us than we do in front of us. And when you've all worked hard, hard and have put in uh, the work that you put in to make that entity level, uh, the, 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 uh, the value that it has, everyone has made a contribution. And it's just important at this stage of your life to realize and figure out how to come together, compromise, and understand that you know, we got more days behind us than we do in front of us, all of us. Well, Johnny, uh, quite a story, quite a career. And, you know, as you know, in music, anyone can have a hit song. Yeah. Someone with zero talent could stumble onto a hit song and blow up. But to be able to continue song after song, album after album, decade after decade, project after project, hit song after hit song, shifting around with different groups, with different entities and so forth, and continuing to be successful, that's talent. Yeah. And, and your talent, I mean, from the first time people heard Johnny Gill, they were like, oh shit, okay, th th this guy's special. This voice is, is unusual and exceptional. And to be able to continue to function, and, and you, as you well know, it doesn't matter how great of a voice you have in music. No, You've got to have the right songs. Yeah. There's lots of great singers that are in lounges right now, you know, for, you know, singing for tips. 30 you know? some years later, just yeah. by the way, I meant to tell you, 30 some years later, my last album, uh, Game Changer 2, mm -hmm. uh, Soul of a Woman, that was my first time in my career. My That album was an independent album. Yep. I, I, I it debuted number one. <laughs> right. Years later, it's just, and that's independent, but it's yeah, the uh, work. J Skills it's Entertainment, the, your, yeah, own, your own label. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, soul of a Woman. My mom, God rest her soul, she passed in April. But I remember Sorry playing the loss. first single, thank you, the first single, which was Soul of a Woman. I played it for her when it was in its raw stage, and she was like, yeah, yeah, this is going to be a hit. That's the one. And uh, she was like, play that song again. And she didn't, she just, she just loved that song. And it, I was like, this one is for you, mommy. And sure enough, that was my first single. That one went to number one. The album came out, debut, goes to number one. You know, and it, it reminded me and allowed me and let me know that no matter whether these BETs and Soul Train Awards and all these other people that can continue to keep overlooking me and not acknowledging what I've done in this game, that's my greatest rewards is when I show up at those buildings and there's asses in the seats. And when you can continue to keep still doing what you're doing, and mix and understand that what God has for you can't no man take away and destroy. And so I'm grateful still. Yes. I'm still grateful. But I'm like anybody. You want to continue to work and you want to continue to build your legacy. And those awards don't mean nothing because they just go on the shelf. But it's just about the fact that it's just adding to the legacy of my work that you want to leave here for people to understand how hard you work and what you've been able to accomplish that will set the bar and set the stage for the other, those that are coming behind me. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I'm okay. I don't need to have to buy, uh, I mean, the, the, those awards don't, they can sit on there and they collect dust, but I'm talking about the meaning of it for me. Y'all can keep the trophy if you, if you want, but <laughs> the meaning of it is just a part of what I felt. This, it's a part of what builds, what adds to the legacy of what I've done in my hard work. And maybe at some days they'll do it like they did with Gerald. Gerald, my dear brother, brother and friend, he wanted and worked so hard to get a Grammy. You know when he got his Grammy? When his eyes was closed and his feet was cold. They decided they wanted oh, they decided he to died. get him. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Not understanding how talented and what this guy, the work that he had put in of doing this. And listen, it might end up being my story too. I don't know. But at the end of the day, <laughs> you, you, know, you never know, man. But but the work, you know, I, I've always heard you work for the the reward, not the award. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and yeah. you've been rewarded. Consistently. So, oh my God. Consistently. Yes. Yeah. Consistently with the yeah. fans, with yes. the sales, yeah. with the adoration, with the yeah. people who were influenced by you. And, you know, you guys are still doing your thing. You're still drawing big crowds. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. An incredible Absolutely. body of work. Uh, the biopic was, was very dope. 
And, so grateful. Uh, hey, man, I really appreciate you coming in. Wish you all the best. I'm looking forward to what's coming up next with Johnny Gill. Well, man, thanks for having me. I like I told you, I watch. I, I listen. I binge watch. Thank <laughs> you, man. I, like, I was shocked I when you said that when you came watch. in and we were talking. Oh, I'm like, my oh God. shit! I, I'll just sit and I just like because it's just interesting guests that you have on and watching everyone just being able to talk about their journey, their story. Yeah. Some pretty, some not so pretty, and it's mm -hmm. like it's all a part of. Just I take a little piece of all that stuff because you can apply those things to your life, but you can also understand and appreciate people's journeys because we all got one. Everyone has one. And so you keep it real and allow them to keep it real. So I'm like, hey, man, I appreciate it. That's what it is. Johnny Gill. Until next time. Yes, Peace. Sir.